hear us? Oh, yay! <laughs> that works. Okay, great. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit of have a dis little distance from the microphone. You can raise your hand. You can hear me. Yep, looks like they can, and I'm gonna try to move it. Great, fantastic. And can you also verify that you are seeing the um, slide deck home base? Yeah, because I, I can I can see it on mine. I can see it on yours. Yep. Right, great. All right, then we will get started. Thank you all for being here today. Um, this slide is a bit there for you um, if you need to access it for everybody. And thank y'all in the room for being patient this morning. <laughs> How are you? Heather's yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, this does great. <laughs> um, yeah, it is a Monday morning for sure for me. I don't know about y'all, but for sure for me. Um, I decided to drive this morning instead of um, staying last night. I mean, that's really never, ever a good <laughs> idea. You know, I don't know what I was thinking. So, uh, a little rush, a little rush this morning. Um, here is the home base meetup schedule. We've already, you know, with this week being the second, we're halfway through the school year. Can you believe that? We're halfway through the school year. Craziness. My daughter came home. Or comes home from college today. She's halfway done with college today. I'm like, wow, wow that's, I know, right? <laughs> How does that happen? How does that happen? I don't know that. I mean, like, idiot. Oh, well. But anyway, uh, our next sessions will be in February. And so, you know, we kind of flip flop on the state, which side we start with. So, next time we're starting in the east. Um, and then we'll be back um, beginning in the, on this side of the, the state um, at the beginning of the week in April. So I hope you have all of those dates down, um, both in the room and online. Um, Pam, do you want to talk about the CCES? Yes! <laughs> so um, if you didn't just hear me a few minutes ago, uh, we do have CCES coming up um, April 5th through 9th. Um, the Corey kind of sent us a, a snowball when they said that we couldn't have any of our dates in March because of March Madness. So that is why we're in April this year, um, because of March Madness, um, which is understandable. We know no one will be able to pay $500 a night for a hotel in Greensboro. Um, so we are excited to be back at the quarry. Um, they are supposed to have completely redone their internet system. Ooh. Because <laughs> they, have yeah, they, have, they have switched over from a Sheraton to a Marriott. And Marriott has much different standards with their internet and network so supposedly they spent like over a million dollars so I'm, I'm hoping that's the case halfway there yeah <laughs> yes. I know right um so I do know that um Jill Darrow who's kind of our lead for the conference um she goes out there and she will be doing tests on their network to make sure it's where they say they are so um but the main thing is right now we need presenters right we need your proposals uh, so please click on that link and submit a proposal. Um, I promise you, your ideas are good enough. I know sometimes it's hard to think about, you know, do I really have something worthy to share? Yes, you do. Um, because that's how we learn is from sharing together and getting that conversation started. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me or Christy. We'd be happy to like bounce ideas off each other. Um, and we can even, you know, partner together to help you with your proposals um, and your sessions if, you know, you want to refine your ideas a little bit more. Um, so the lead presenter for the proposals do get free conference registration. So that's a nice perk. Um, and then if you have a co-presenter, they get free registration for the day um, of the session. So, um, and that's a discount, right? You know, that's still a discount off of the full registration if they want to attend the full conference. They get a prorated amount. So, any, any questions about CCES? Is ECAS part of that? Huh? Yeah. And I'd love to see teachers. If y'all have yes. like teachers that are rock stars, whether it's your virtual teachers or, you know, face to face teachers. Um, I did, um, I co-presented a session at the NCCTM, whatever conference, the math um, conference with the teacher. And out of every, I mean, not that I haven't presented with teachers before I have, but at this particular point in time, you know, it's the first time I've done it in a while. And um, just the, the audience was fantastic. The feedback was fantastic. Like, I think that people just seeing what real teachers are really, really doing um, is so powerful. So. 
um, especially because your co-presenters get free conference registration for the day, that would be a fantastic way to bring in some teachers. So. Yeah, and um, for our online attendees, if you guys want to be unmuted at any time, just raise your hand and we will unmute you. Um, we just have everyone muted because we know there's a lot of multitasking. <laughs> um, that occurs, so we, we just have everyone muted, but if you guys want to raise your hands at any point, we will unmute you, so. I look forward to seeing everybody there, and NCTAS. Yes. Does everybody come to NCTAS? Yeah. And did you want to share the meeting? Share the meeting. We're going to have the meeting at NCTAS? Oh! <laughs> Yeah, so we are. We're actually going to have a, um, do we, do, it's a half a day, right? Yeah, so we're going to have a pre-conference. Yeah. On the pre-conference day before NC ties, we'll have a canvas. Yes, and so we'll be sending out details about that. Of course, we have a little bit more information just on specific times, but it'll be for all campus. I mean, it's safe for you all to get together and have, you know, a good group meeting. Um, well, that's what the overlap of the director's meeting. Uh, that's no. in the evening. So this yeah, is evening. this is in the morning. We have a room from I think it's nine thirty to twelve. That's what I was. I need to get the details specifically. Yeah, they haven't yeah. sent us a room yet. Yeah, they're yeah. still working on it. But we did get a room um, for us to meet. So. Excited about that. Um, it was it was something we wanted to do last year. We didn't get quite to do it, so we're really excited about it. Wednesday. Uh huh. Yeah, it'd be Wednesday. Yeah. I thought you meant to share something on oh, the screen. No, I was like, oh, I thought sorry. I was sharing. <laughs> you know, it's still it's still <laughs> Monday. It's still Monday. Yes. <laughs> you get the joy of being the recorded first session of the week. You know, by tomorrow, right? You need to go through this every single week. So today, what we're going to do, just at least in the morning, um, is we'll some welcome and introductions, and then um, Jason Weinberger, is Jason online. Yeah. Jason is going to share from Cleveland County something that they're you know, doing that he agreed to highlight. Um, also, at any point in time, anybody online or in the room that wants to share anything else, I'd much rather hear from you all than hear me speak. Um, so we can take as much time as we need to for that. And then just from the feedback form, these were kind of the top vote getters of what people wanted to talk about. So I've dropped resources in. Um, I always say these these really are your meetings, so if you need to go off topic, if we need to talk about something else, just let me know and we'll go in a different direction. But these were the ones um, kind of in order, uh, Power Teacher Pro Grade Pass Back, Mastery Pass, Outcomes, and then LTI Integrations. Um, I also have some product updates and reminders, and then we have a form, and you're welcome to go ahead and start filling that out if you needed to. It's a, well, it's a dot with a table. But if you have any hot topics to talk about this afternoon, we normally in the afternoon do kind of more roundtable discussions of whatever your topics are. So feel free to drop those in as you were. If you think about something while we're talking, please do that. Um, and oh, what time are we going to break for lunch? 12. We're going to break at 12. Okay, so this morning session will go till 12. All right. Um, so I'm going to start in the room and then um, I'm going to let Pam um, hopefully facilitate our online introductions. But what I'd love for you to do is say your name, your school, your district and role, and then something that you're doing to positively promote Canvas in your school or district. Um, you know, and I, I actually meant that this was another thing I meant to edit because I put 10 days of Christmas and I meant to say 12 days of Christmas, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but if you need something to think about, like what are the some things that I'm doing? You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to give you some think time here before I put anybody on the spot. But there are some links here. There's some communication ideas and um, a K-12 communications toolkit in there. Um, thinking about how you're celebrating those top users and courses, you know, your real Canvas champion teachers. And then, yeah, I don't know why I put 10 days and I forgot to change it when I got here. But, they, you know, I have districts that do 12 days of Canvas Christmas. So they send out either a challenge or they send out some type of celebration or they send out like something, just some kind of little cute something that corresponds to the holidays saying, here, think about Canvas today. I didn't want to type this one on the slide deck because I just didn't want to. But we even have a school district doing learning in the loo. Um, and they post Canvas tips in the bathroom. Because uh, <laughs> they're like, where else can people learn? But you know, hey, let's just put a little tidbit, a little did you know fact in the in the bathroom. Uh, so I thought that was kind of a neat thing. We had all kinds of fun trying to think of a name for that, or alternate names for that. Uh, but they decided on learning in the loop. So I'm going to go back a slide and um, 
just because you know Kevin is sitting in the front, I'm gonna let him start. <laughs> you don't mind? I don't. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Kevin Combs. I'm with Scotland County School. I'm the uh, director of instructional technology there. Uh, we brought Canvas in on the first opportunity we had. Matter of fact, I believe we visited your old school district to uh, see it in action and really enjoyed it. We use Canvas, especially in the uh, middle school and high school, for everything. It's a district mandate that we utilize it. Uh, we do everything from online PD to obviously all of our uh, instruction as we are a one to one district. Uh, the thing that we've embarked on that's new and uh, the thing that we're going to promote it is we're trying to give teachers days off. We, uh, we've we been affected by the hurricanes for the last two that came through there where we had up to 14 days of school that was canceled. Um, so we've put together packets that will allow us to continue the continuity of instruction, even if we're off campus and then uh, not have to make those days up. Uh, if teachers were able to give some artifacts of, uh, to the fact that they actually continued with their instruction. Along with that, we also had to get a grant to have all of our students the opportunity to have hotspots if they don't have connectivity at home. So we have a school district with 100% connectivity, 100% internet access, um, and 100% utilization in the 6 through 12, actually 6 through 13, you count early college um, canvas with our uh, uh, with our instruction going into the building. So uh, we, we try to utilize everything we do. We keep up with our cabinet meetings. We keep up with their uh, communication between district office and with school principals. Um, anything that you ever want to know about what's going on in our district, we have an opportunity for principals and assistant principals um, and other building administrators to come in and review everything that we've covered and archived within campus. Kevin, do you remember what month you shared? Was it May? Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I was say January, so you can't do it. Yay! All right, so, and, and I'm going to drop the link to this course in chat just in case you haven't ever joined it before. Um, and, and I'll put it up for you all as well. Um, this um, meeting, May 6th, we have a statewide call every month. That's something I was going to plug again at the end. Um, I tell for a tenth and a tenth regularly. Um, but we do have the slide deck here for May as well as the recording where Kevin really talks about that. The link to his presentation. Let's talk about how they're using it for e-learning, but also how they're using create, create curriculum courses and how they're putting them. Um, in we comments. have everything totally wide open for anyone on the Creative Commons license to utilize and redistribute, remix anything that we created. We basically have almost every subject again through middle school uh, and high school, with the exception of some of our arts and uh, electives that we have core curriculum in. And we're actually going back through that now with the Open Educational Resources through NC Commons. We uh, we launched that. Um, we had a district-wide PD actually last Friday, and uh, so we launched that, and we're actually updating a lot of what we have in Canvas, going through the vetting process, helps provide them with the rubric um, uh, for vetting your digital resources and what you're using. That was presented in the end of the Educational Resources PD. So uh, we're still trying to grow with it. I'm going to put this, I'm going to go ahead and put it in the slide deck too. So again, anybody that doesn't have it, I try to keep like our home base meetup presentations in here. We do, sometimes I do announcements. Um, sorry, I mean, I, I'm on a Mac usually, so sometimes I hit the wrong buttons when I'm not on a Mac. Um, This uh, course we do, uh, again, I, I, usually I put in some resources from our home base meetup, including the presentation. I put our the statewide call recordings, um, the home base uh, bulletins. Every month we try to do a campus spotlight in there. Um, so I put them in that course, um, as well as anything else I think will be helpful to you. So if you don't have access already, I would suggest um, enrolling in this course. It is in my Canvas instance. So when you go to it, it'll say, do you already have a Canvas account? And if you um, have already been in my instance for some reason, whether you took a trading course or whatever, then you can say yes and enroll and, and register, or excuse me, log in if you remember that password. But if you've never been in my instance, you have to create a username and password, and it can be whatever you want it to be. Um, because my instance is not connected to NCA Cloud. 
So you also want a book mark it, most likely. That's there for you. That was a longer introduction uh, than probably <laughs> we expected, um, but I am going to just uh, turn it over to Samantha. My name is Samantha Campbell, and I am the Director of Secondary Education in Lincoln County, and I am also the Canvas Administrator for our district. And one of the things that I've been doing this year, trying to um, I am the only person who does the Canvas stuff in my district, so um, I've tried to embed like um, more Canvas modeling through the professional development that I'm teaching. So I've done that with administrators as well as the teachers um, through the trainings and stuff we're already doing. I do a blended learning model. I want to teach how Using Canvas is not just students sitting on a computer in the room in isolation while the teacher's at the desk, <laughs> that you can utilize it for a blended model learning in the classroom. Thank you. So. Yay. <laughs> Gold star. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, my name I'm Celeste Sadler, and I'm here from Jasper County Schools. Um, I'm actually the school dad lead, so I'm going to be learning quite a bit here about campus because I thought this was a school course, so it's hard. Oh, well, school dad's oh, actually next door. Next door. Oh, next door. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. That's yeah. my fault. <laughs> Yes, uh, I, 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 unfortunately, I can't split myself, and since we're doing the recording here, I'm in here, but I'll sit down here. So, yeah. Sorry. Well, we would love for you to learn about yeah. Canvas. Because <laughs> Gaston is, is embarking on Canvas this year. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, we have a virtual academy, and I know they're using it in the middle of my school. Oh. So it's growing. So and when you go yeah. back, say, hey, we need this for Canvas. Person. Okay, yeah. well, good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. They, yeah. They'll be okay. next door. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right, so I'm going to let Pam. Um, I'm going to try to do it here because I think the sound will be better. Yeah. And All right, so Jason said that he can be unmuted. So, Jason, get ready. <laughs> Hi there. I'm Jason Leinberger with Cleveland County Schools. I'm the district learning coordinator for our system. Awesome, Jason. We, um, we're, we're, we're looking a little puzzled because your sound came out of a different place than what it did previously when we tested. <laughs> anyway, we're having audio issues. But thank you so much, Jason, and we look forward to uh, having you share with us. Um, in just a second, let's go ahead and see who else is on the call, and then I'm going to circle back to you if that's all right. And if you have anything um, that you want to share um, in terms of present, and you don't have to, but if you have something, then you can drop it into the chat or questions as well. We'll get it pulled up. All right. So next, uh, James said that he can be unmuted. So James, here you go. Hey, everybody. This is James Doherty. I'm in Davidson County. Uh, I'm the Arts Education Distance Learning Program Specialist in whatever other title that I get appointed for the day. They call it promotions. Uh, <laughs> We are using Canvas in Davidson County uh, for two big things. One is we have all of our secondary curriculum documents there for teachers to access. It really is kind of promoting them to use Canvas to find things and be in the system. And uh, we have a virtual academy that is continuing to grow and all of our teachers from the school system that teach courses in that are using Canvas for their platform. And that's going really well and we're continuing to add courses. and. Uh, we're even in, embarking um, on a, some steps to try to regain some homeschool students uh, that will, the virtual academy is going to play a big part of that and Canvas as well. So it's very exciting. Yay, thanks, James. Awesome. All right, do we have someone else ready to share? Um, it does not look like it. Uh, anyone else? If you'd like to raise your hand, otherwise I'll just go through the list. We have uh, Darlene with us. Elizabeth from NCAT is here. Um, and I, I know Elizabeth, I think, is going to join us in person tomorrow. So yeah. excited to see her. Um, James, Jason, we have uh, Josh Miller, uh, Linda Bullock, Michael Williams, uh, Patricia Coldren, Ryan Miller, and then we also have Tessa from our home base team. 
Well, I appreciate everybody being here, taking time today. We recognize online we might have people dropping in and out because it is a long time to be on a virtual call. <laughs> uh, it's really hard to hide away that long, isn't it? So <laughs> at least if you come away from, yeah. people can't can't come right. in and steal you. But uh, right. we know on a virtual call it's hard to be away that long. So thank you for being with us as long as you can today. Um, I do want to just real quickly point this resource out um, because I, I did talk about it. We have, um, and it actually links to the Canvas Success Model, which is a pretty new resource. I shared it with you in August, but specifically today, when you're thinking about planning, um, there is a communication tab here, and under those steps, there are communication method ideas. This is a forced Google, or forced copy Google Doc. And also communications toolkits, which again is a forced copy Google Doc. And those, like I love this communication method idea, it's just because I think it helps to think about what are some other ways we can promote Canvas um, besides just like emails, right, or like principal meetings. And so, you know, thinking about some of the different ideas that they have here, um, I think, you know, cafeteria postings kind of similar to the learning in the loo, right? Um, places where, you know, people might see um, something and be like, oh yeah, I didn't know that that could happen. So, uh, skits, that's pretty cool. I love to see somebody, you know, record a Canvas skit that they do. Uh -huh. um, I think that telling a story from your stakeholder's perspective is awesome. So, I mean, I could see it being a skit with, um, I actually was on my way here today thinking, things that parents say to me, my parent friends, you know, like, um, Science projects were our due, you know, about this time, and people are like, have said, just said to me, this has nothing to do with Canvas, it's just like personal conversations. The teacher didn't send home the directions, like, you know, I don't know what we're supposed to be doing, right? So, like, thinking of using Canvas, okay, I'm a parent, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing for this science project, oh, I can log into Canvas and see it, right? Reading logs, my kid left it at school, yeah. right? They left their homework folder at school, they left whatever at school, okay? We can log into Canvas and we can get it. So. I mean, I can see definitely some pretty valuable, funny skits even coming out of what are some of those stakeholder um, pieces, engagements, ways that can even help solve, solve problems. So anyway, I think this is a pretty cool resource just to kind of look through and say, what am I doing? What are we not doing? And then this communication toolkit. Now, some of these are more for like your beginning journey with Canvas, but you might be able to repurpose some of these email templates or social media templates for something else that you've got going on, whether it's a relaunch or um, there's a faculty survey one. Um, so something thinking about, you know, what you have to, um, here's faculty survey, student surveys, parent surveys. So again, that communications toolkit hopefully will be helpful to you. Yeah. Now, how did you get to that? So from this, um, this is linked to the Canvas success model. Yeah. And when you enter into it, it just like takes you, I think, straight to vision. Yeah, but this is under, well, actually, it took me to plan. Because I clicked on plan, I thought it was last time too, but plan and then communications, oh, okay. the tab and reduced it steps. Yeah. My goal is to definitely start putting together some of those stories like I was just telling. Um, some of those things that Canvas helps to solve, right? Because I just think that we so often, and not in the, in the Fantastic opportunity to tell stories from a teacher perspective too to say these are problems that it solves for a teacher. Um, but you know, there are other stakeholders as well. And so I think I'd really like to think about the lens of that student and that parent. All right, I'm going to jump in unless I know Pam will stop me if there are questions or anything, or y'all need me to, to be quiet. So please raise your hand or put in chat or questions if you have something online that you need me um, to slow down and read revisit or if you all have something please let me know um but power teacher pro grade pass back was the the top or second maybe but getter in terms of um these topics for today so i just linked in here again the slide deck i do update this just to let y'all know even though it's the same link i haven't changed it in like the last two and a half years I, I do update it so every time there's a change i update this slide deck so that the same thing that y'all have and you've been given out hopefully just continues to remain um, relevant um, so these directions are still good um the directions you need know, to walk teachers through step by step how they link their Canvas courses to a Power Teacher Pro Grade um, book. 
Um, very important. I, I, and even this is another thing I've done is throughout the years, as I noticed some problems, I try to call them out. <laughs> um, like one of the biggest things was people who are manually cross-listing sections, sometimes they were importing those categories prior to cross-listing. Well, that means there was never a connection to that, that other section that got cross-listed in. So cross-list first, then import categories. And it's okay to fix it. You know, you can go back and re-import them again. It doesn't duplicate. So it's fine to do it later. But what is important is if you're cross-listing, you have to make sure that in Power School, those sections, those uh, grading categories are the same for each of those sections that you cross-listed into Canvas. Because if you have, most of the time if people are teaching all honors or all AP or all CP or whatever, they do have the same grading categories. Those are the same course codes in, camp, or in Power School. So in a one-to-many, y'all know what I'm talking about, in your one-to-many configuration, those courses would already be together in Canvas. Not in a one-to-one, -one, but in a one-to-many, they would already be together in Canvas. If they're already together in Canvas, you know, the grading, grading categories are already the same in Power Pro, you don't have to worry about much. Where there's a bigger issue is when people have CP courses and honors courses and the teacher wants to manually cross list them and but then power teacher pro they may have had like an honors project category in the honors course that does not exist in CP. What if your categories are the same? Do you have different weights for the different uh, like honors may have 30 percent versus 20 percent? We don't have stack weights. So the only thing to be to think about there though would be the grades in Canvas would not match your grades in power school. Which would be confusing probably to teachers and parents, I mean, just parents and students. I mean, you'd have to explain it. Yeah. But um, yeah, so some people don't, they, they, they communicate to parents that the ultimate grade source is power school always, and then in Canvas, you're looking at more daily grades and not always looking for an overall grade anyway. If that's the consistent messaging that's coming out, I don't think that's problematic. Um, but yeah, so that's you know that's one of the things that we need to make sure that teachers are doing. And y'all, if teachers have assignments and they're getting those errors and they say grading category missing, the best thing to do is say go re-import your categories because pretty much that's probably something like this has happened, right? Where they forgot to do that. Um, but after they import them, or after they create them in Power Teacher Pro, they have to wait 24 hours. It says to open up both systems at the same time. I've never figured that out, but it says to do it, so do it. <laughs> um, import them into Canvas, and then you just make sure that they import it. And the way that you know that they import it is when you import grading categories, they always have a little door. Um, and I guess I could actually present from here. They I always have a little door or a piece of paper. I don't know what I call it a door icon, but it's actually probably paper. But the imported categories look like this, not like this. See, there's no icon here. There's an icon here. They import to the bottom of the category list, so sometimes teachers don't see them. Because if they already had 150 assignments and five groups in their, in their course because they copied content from a previous year, they may not see them. Another really weird thing that happened this year that I didn't expect, because you know, most people converted to Power Teacher Pro last year, so this is the first time kind of having made copies of those courses and bringing them into a new year. Um, when teachers imported courses from last year, categories imported with these little icons that were not truly connected to Power Teacher Pro. So again, they got the error, categories missing. Solution for that is to go up there and import those assignment groups from Power Teacher Pro. Right? Um, so same, same fix with that, mess, with that message. Um, the other thing is, if they're getting that message, then they may not have, they may have the assignments living in a category that's not connected, and so they've got to drag it down. That's another big thing, right, is they just have not moved their, their assignments. And the really cool thing, let's say that they had a homework group before they imported. These three dots allow them to go over here and say, move all of the assignments here to this other one. And they can, or you can even say delete this whole group, and it'll say, okay, where do you want to move everything to? So you don't have to like drag them individually down. You got that like in mass um, option, which is really nice. And I put the guides for each of these things at the bottom too 
Um, so hopefully that'll be helpful if you need it to point something specifically out to a teacher. Um, again, this is what that says, verify that all your Power Teacher Pro assignments are in Power Teacher Pro categories. Now teachers may have assignments that they don't want to go back to Power Teacher Pro. Uh, one thing specifically I'll mention is that we're going to talk about learning mastery paths in a minute. Mastery path assignments do not, they don't sneak back to Power Teacher Pro. The reason why is because any assignment that is not assigned to an entire course or an entire section within a course will not pass back. Power Teacher Pro won't accept the grades. It's like, this, this wasn't assigned to everybody. We're not going to put it in here. Um, and a mastery path assignment, because it is very differentiated, um, and it just goes to those students who need those assignments, then those assignments don't go to Power Teacher Pro. We'll talk more about that when we get to the, to the next section um, when we talk about mastery paths and kind of my faith and solution on that. Um, but there are times there may be just like some formative stuff that is not going to get counted towards the student's overall grade. And so you want the students to get that feedback in terms of the score. You want them to know, you know, yes, you're at mastery or no, you're not at mastery or whatever. Not quite yet. Um, but you don't want that to be part of their grade. So not every assignment has to be in one of those categories, but if you want to pass that to you also have to make sure that that little check mark in the assignment settings is checked that says pass back to Power Teacher Pro and or I'll show you another place you can see that. And it also has to be published. Um, that's another thing. If it's not published, it's not going back to Power Teacher Pro. And this is like a little less problematic because I think now we force it, but it has to be, the title has to be less than 30 characters and it has to have a due date. Um, if not, then those things will not pass back to Power Teacher Pro. The other thing is, if you're using weighted grading categories, if you don't have a due date, or teachers don't have a due date, those things are not even getting put in a grading period. I say weighted grading categories. I mean, if you're using grading periods, um, like first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, so teachers don't have due dates, but those things are not getting put in those grading periods at all. So they're not being calculated in the student score in Canvas. Um, obviously, they're not going to Power Teacher Pro because they don't have a due date either. So. Um, when you're creating an assignment, in this, this box up here is the um, from the edit, the assignment details page. That's where that box is that says include this assignment grade when seeking to your school's student information system. So that's the box when teachers are creating assignments. They have to check to say this is a, an assignment I want to sync to Canvas. Read Power Teacher Pro. This is the assignments page. If they have checked that box, this would be green, okay? They can also just toggle it here. So if they're having issues with something, then they can also go check that are all those green. This one is the one telling them it's published, so all those have to be green, and all those have to be green to say that it's enabled. The, the settings sync to Power Teacher Pro is uh, enabled. And so James just chimed in that um, they had a problem where a teacher had incorrect categories, but they didn't know about it until the second quarter. So he had to go back in and help the teacher because she was locked out um, because it was past the yeah, first quarter. And thanks for that, because that also reminds me of something else. So um, you recently, like what, October 21st-ish, <laughs> got a communication from DPI saying, that because of the Power Teacher Pro upgrade this year, if um, your school or district had chosen to lock grade periods in Power Teacher Pro, then teachers needed to go in and disable them. So basically turn it black, you know, make sure it's not green for any assignments that were in Q1. Um, because if, it, if they were in Q1 and Canvas was still trying to send those grades because Canvas was still trying to send everything. Mm -hmm. But Power Teacher Pro was saying, you can't change anything from Q1 anymore. So Power Teacher Pro was just saying, nope, we're not taking anything from Canvas. So in order to solve that, teachers have to disable that for the things that were Q1. Now, the really great news is um, in their courses, I don't know if I have one that's connected to a grading period that I've been able to show you real quick. Um, but let me see. Probably not. Um, in their courses, though, who is jumping? Yeah. 
if you have or if you're using grading periods up here teachers can sort by grading period like they could change it to q1 so they could just go disable that setting for all the ones in q1 like they would know anything that's shown on this page because i've said it's quarter one i'm just disabling that so they can sort, uh, search and sort and filter that way so james just wants to make sure that uh, that it needs to be part of their process now that make sure that teachers go back and unthink those assignments at the end of the quarter. Yeah, and, and I, I mentioned that I've been using the same slide deck forever. We already had the instructions in there. It's like maybe step four at the end where you see like um, tips or whatever, because it's better practice not to continue trying to send like tons and tons of data every time they're syncing anyway. It's going to make it faster. So we already said after you're done with an assignment, it's great. I'm thinking. Now we'll tell you we're working on our end on a solution to fix it. Um, as my, like they're working, um, they're, there's already script been written. It's just a really still difficult process. So they're, they're tweaking it to try to figure out what they can do to make it easier. But we are going to fix it on our end, at least. That's what I've been told. <laughs> so, um, Did you know? yeah, so I mean, there's active work going on um, for me to fix that. Um, so basically, it would say Canvas stop sending things. Like we're going to look to see if you have a closed date, which would mean it would be really important you all to make sure that your grading periods have closed dates that align to that power teacher pro lot day mm -hmm. but what we, what it basically would do is say okay if, if there's a closed date then we're going to not send the, the data at the point yeah. right right for those students who make up work or, or resubmit something is there anything that a teacher would need to toggle to re-synchronize those so, grades without putting them again if they um, if they have the daily sync set, it'll automatically do it. And if not, then any time the next time they hit sync, it'll do it. There was an issue, and I don't remember if it was on Canvas or if it was on Power Teacher Pro. Whereas, if I had ten assignments, I had a student completed two of those assignments, and let's say they got hundred on both of those, the end term average would be hundred for that student, even though they were missing significant work. When that transferred back over to Power Teacher Pro. It was automatically exempting the student for anything not submitted within Canvas, not giving them a grade of zero, for example. So someone who had submitted two assignments out of the 10 would receive a higher grade than someone who submitted all 10 assignments, but maybe didn't receive full credit for those. And I'm talking to someone, and I don't remember the answer to save my life of how that was handled. Um, so, I mean, it would really just deal with how the two systems treat ungraded. Um, so if Power Teacher Pro treats ungraded as not included in the score, then that's going to be exempt. However, when you're in Canvas, one easy thing to do would be for the teachers to um, apply this grading rule. And you'll have to excuse me because I have the old grade book turned on in this class. I'm going to turn the new one on so I can show you. Um, I have it. Did that look like the old grade book to me? Didn't it look like the old grade book? Maybe it's just because I didn't figure it in there. I don't know. It was something perfect. All right, so they can automatically apply a zero for missing assignments after the due date. That doesn't mean they can't change it. Right? They could go in and change it, but that way it would automatically actually give a point value of zero to those assignments. Is that something we can set as a default profile for all teachers in the district? So they have to go into it. Is there something you can do in Power Teacher Pro? I don't know. Well, so yeah, you, can, you, can lock, you can lock things in Power Teacher Pro. So you might be able to set it in Power Teacher Pro if there's a missing assignment grade, then it would automatically be a zero. I think we started the Power Teacher, and, and we, we weren't able to do it in Power Teacher Pro for some reason. Hmm. It kept coming back. back. I, think, I think with the new upgrade, it's August. Have you tried since August? It was a last year issue. Uh, okay, so I think with um, the new upgrade that I believe remember seeing in their documentation that there was new things uh, that you can control at the district level. Okay. Uh, like a rule, like grading rules. Yeah. So it might be that way, but yeah, and unfortunately, it's not a district setting. Um, and honestly, I've had some conversations with the engineers, the product team, about some more district settings for gradebook, and they're a little hesitant just because of, in most cases, there's a lot of autonomy given to teachers with grading practices, and I don't know. It, it, you know, you solve a problem over here that creates a bigger problem over here. <laughs> and, and the last one, because this yeah. is unique to our district, we have a policy set up, no, uh, no child can receive less than 50 on any assignment. Is there a way to set a threshold for? The set, on the same screen, the teacher can, but not a district. There, there is a 50 you put yeah. in. Yeah, you could put in whatever number you want. 
Gotcha. Well, I mean, right. Okay. Like in in, in essence, you level. could say that the missing assignment was yeah. fifty. Right. Yeah. And you could also say like right. for late yeah, submissions, right. like like if a teacher personally, I don't like deductions for late submissions. So please know that, that philosophically, I disagree with this. <laughs> but <laughs> if they were like say a deducted. Um, you know, or whatever, whatever per day, huh. um, then you could say it's still the lowest grade possible would be 50. Again, philosophically, <laughs> philosophically, we're like cringy. I need to build a whole train of teachers. Look what you have that big one. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, they can certainly do that. So it's a teacher by teacher basis. Um, but yeah, we and we did. We went through that work of as a district setting some grading expectations where we said, you know, these are some non-negotiables. We're not doing behavior-based grading, period. We're doing mastery grading, period. You know, so like those are conversations we have to have in that. Um, so yeah, good question. Um, after you, after the teacher, uh, make sure you know all that stuff set. Um, then they can go, and I still I need to take this off because hopefully y'all have moved to the mid grade book. If you have not turned it on, this is going to be a reminder later, but I'm going to say it now too. Make sure you turn on the mid grade book <clears throat> before second semester or January 20th because that's when old grade book is going to go away anyway. Um, but in the new grade book, in the um, there's a button that says "Sync to Power Teacher Pro." It's under Actions, and so. That's where they can see. Now, that is only going to see the assignments from the last 30 days. But if they are on this page, the teacher is, and they do a bulk grade pass back, it does everything in the course. And, and when I say last 30 days, I mean last 30 days from when an assignment was graded, not when it was due. So for your question about the student who has submitted work late, as long as that student's grade is submitted in the last 30 days, it would still take it even if it was two months late, you know. But the bulk sink is going to pull in everything. And that's another troubleshooting tip. Honestly, you know, when teachers say they're having issues, um, besides the fact that I would recommend, and I skip the screen, so let me get back to it. I would recommend that they go to their monitoring and reporting tab to look to see why. You have a monitoring reporting tab at the district level where you can see all of the things across the district, but in each individual course, they have it too. Sometimes it says grade sync. It depends on when it got turned on in your district or school. Um, but the monitoring reporting will let you see every all the things and all of those different um, results. So whether it failed or was canceled or whatever. And this is a monitoring tool error message dictionary. So that's actually hyperlinked. That explains the errors that teachers see and gives you like troubleshoot tips. The most common are in you know, a category that exists to have them reinforce the category and or make sure the assignments are in the right categories. Um, make sure sometimes it'll say, um, oh, the message, well, let's look at some of the messages <laughs> together. But the, most of the tips I would say can be resolved by making sure that the assignment's in the right category, making sure that they've re-imported their category just in case if needed, or making sure, um, or doing a bulk sync, because the bulk sync will just go back and catch things. If there happened to be some type of like network glitch or something when they were trying to send, send grades originally. But you'll see all of these different error messages and it'll tell you what it means and what the steps are to resolve it or fix it. So. Like the assignment already exists, so if they have been the two assignments with the same name, one's already been synced to Power Teacher Pro, they're going to get an error message saying this. So you know, change, delete the assignment in Power Teacher Pro and or um, change the name of it, right? So you can see all of these different error messages. So that's a really helpful resource. Also on the same monitoring reporting tab, the screenshot I took before they added the second tab, but there is a sync tab. In addition to the bulk sync that they can run, they also can schedule a daily sync. And I mean, I certainly recommend that. I mean, that's just make sure that daily, you know, those grades are sinking, it's sending less data. It's also probably not sending at as high traffic times because not everybody in the district is trying to hit the button at the same time. Um, you know, last day of the last, <laughs> uh, or the last day, the last hour of the quarter. And then we just have some of these reminders. Um, you know, just because there's an error doesn't mean it failed. Also, y'all, and I know you know this, but just super important. 
they don't always take automatically. I mean, I would, it says, you know, it could take up to 24 hours. Um, I don't think it normally takes up to 24 hours, but if a teacher has just saved grades and they're saying only one student's grade populated, but they just did it, tell them to wait a couple hours, you know? I mean, that's nine times out of 10, teachers submit a ticket, and by the time that somebody looks at it, those grades are already in Power Teacher Pro. It just was a matter of, or I go in because a teacher submitted a ticket and somebody is like contact me about it, and they had tried, like on that monitoring reporting tab, I can see that they tried to sync five times in the last you know, 15 minutes, and all these syncs are in queue. Well, that's like bottleneck and stuff too. So just, you know, as you work with them, make sure that they know that it's not automatic. And of course, it's not automatic for those high traffic times. Again, this is where, you know, disable those post assist. Once they're done grading the assignment, turn that off so it doesn't keep trying to send it. Um, no go on individual assignments. So individual assignments don't pass back. We mentioned that. And I just really, um, you know, continue to say, make sure that you are helping teachers understand that they can submit support tickets, right? They can submit a support ticket. If you have tier one support, it automatically goes to campus. If you don't automatically have tier one support, send it to us. You know, I, I know me personally, I used to spend forever troubleshooting like a ticket when now in hindsight, I'm like, why can't I just escalate that to campus? Why did I let? <laughs> why did I spend all of my time I try to figure it out? Let them do it. Um, Cause you still have to fill out and you can submit it to, you know, send it to campus, so send it. Um, I'm going to be completely transparent and honest, and y'all probably know, sometimes that first response you get back is like lackluster, um, but you just answer their questions and they're going to escalate it. Um, if it is related to grade passback or data provisioning for PowerSchool, they normally automatically escalate it to our SIS team, who is fantastic and dynamic and phenomenal. Yeah. And the only way that I'm going to get stuff fixed is going to them anyway. So like even if you were to contact me or Jamie or Lauren, we're going to have to go to the SIS team anyway. Um, so yeah, I definitely, especially if it's a power school issue, just have somebody submit a ticket. What I will say, URLs to the course, specific assignment names, specific student names, and screenshots from Power Teacher Pro are always helpful. So if the, if the teacher says, you know, I'm trying to seek this assignment five times and it's not going, um, I don't know why everything else is going, like you link to the course, the name of the assignment, and a screenshot of Power Teacher Pro where they can see all the other assignments, but not that one is always helpful they're going to ask for that anyway, so it just delays the resolution time. Any questions about Power Teacher Pro before we move on and talk about Mastery Pass? No questions there. Y'all good? All right, cool. All right, Mastery Pass. I linked um, the guides here for how instructors use Mastery Pass. For some of the things we're talking about, there are both instructor and admin guides. Mastery Pass is pretty much just an instructor thing. So these are the guides for Mastery Pass. Mastery Pass are like tiered assignments. Um, and so whether we've been you know, revisiting differentiation, differentiation is not new. <laughs> personalized learning is not new, but as like the emphasis on personalized learning has increased, our, our re-emphasis of differentiation has increased. And one of those strategies, especially that has been promoted you know, for the last few years when you're talking about AIG students, not that it's just specific to AIG, but when you look at AIG differentiation strategies, you're always going to see tiered lessons. Um, and again, it's not new, but you're going to see that that, that um, reference to tiered lessons. Mastery paths are basically tiered lessons. So they allow a teacher to begin with, and, and this is teacher design instruction. So, you know, you all know some of the um, pushback or criticism of personalized learning has been people whose perception is to counter what you know what you're trying to combat <laughs> is is a, a student sitting at a computer all day and just not interacting with the teacher and just getting that you know road instruction from the computer that's not it you know and canvas doesn't try to do that we're, we're not you know being a, even adaptive in terms that we're trying to design that instruction at all everything is designed by the teacher um this is also a great place where plc is working together to create things it's fantastic because teachers can say, okay, here's a pre-assessment we're going to give. Based on those results, I'm going to create the tier one, you create tier two, you create tier three pathways. 
Um, you know, especially if you've got teachers and you got data and they recognize my strengths are in design and stuff that really enrich, or my strengths are really that remediation, reteach, and scaffolding. You know, if you have teachers who have a preference or who work together really well and know that those are their strengths, then this is a great opportunity for them to design these mastery paths alone. I'm not going to pretend that it's easy. Like, it's not easy to create a great tiered lesson with the same level of engagement for all three tiers. Because what you sometimes see is you've got a teacher who's created a tiered lesson, and those kids who are at mastery already, oh my gosh, they get to have fun. You know, they get to do cool projects and videos, and they're doing art stuff. And then the kids who score, you know, where they needed a little bit of additional reteaching or some remediation of some foundational skills, they're having to do more, you know, rote stuff. So to design a really great tiered lesson requires for the teacher to understand that all three tiers should be having the same level of engagement. I'm not saying necessarily fun, but engagement, right? So I'm not saying it's easy, but that's where a teacher team's coming together is a really great way to design these. Um, I'm also not going to pretend that these are the best examples in the world because of that reason, but I am going to show you some examples. Um, this course should be public, so you should be able to see them. There's a resource here that has mastery path considerations. So these are just some things, you know, to think about when you're creating a mastery path. So students only see the items that um, once it is unlocked for them because based on their path. And their path is determined by their score on that entry level assessment. So the entry level thing is assigned to everyone. And then based on their performance, they get assigned a path. Um, if, a if a something requires teacher intervention, it has to wait till the teacher gives a grade. So you don't have to have a method. It does not have to be a self-grading quiz as that entry event. But if it's not, then just know the teacher has to grade it before anybody's going to get assigned their path. Or any point on their path, you know, if the things have to be sequential or whatever, then the teacher has to grade it. So that's always important to think about. If there is a page, not assignment, but like a resource, a page students need that wants the teacher wants to be in the mastery path, then they have to make sure to check that box when they're creating the page to enable the mastery paths. The assignments have to be assigned just to mastery paths. This is what this is probably the thing that teachers forget to do more than anything else with creating mastery paths. When you're creating an assignment, I'll go ahead and just show you this. When you're creating an assignment, you have the option of assigning it to multiple different you know, students, um, a section, or to the whole class. So default here for every assignment, it says everyone. In order for it to really be a mastery path assignment and only show to students in that mastery path, the teacher has to actually delete everyone and add mastery path. What I see more than anything is they may have added mastery paths, but they left everyone, and so then still every student see it. Now, remember, if they do do mastery paths, then it's not going to pass that power to okay. Is there anything else they need to change, like? For pass back to power teacher pro. I know it's not going to go because it's a mastery path and it's not going to everyone. But if they've got everything else transferring to power teacher pro, if it'll be just, okay, right? It will. If they disable the setting mode that says uh, or on, that assignment. Yeah, because if not, you probably, they're probably going to get an error message. Okay. okay. Um, it doesn't mean that everything else won't work, but they'll probably get an error message. Um, so you make sure that it's been assigned a mastery path, you know, all the assignments that they want in the path, make sure that it's set up. And then there are some issues, you know, you know the grade pass that doesn't work. Um, the duplicate values, I honestly am not sure about this because um, it's not been problematic for me. Blueprint, it sometimes can be problematic with mastery paths. Um, it doesn't allow you to assign mastery paths based on like learning mastery grades. Now, certainly for a particular assignment, you can have a learning mastery score attached to that assignment and or quiz and the overall score 
would still drive the mastery path, but it's not like you could say, I want all students who are at three or lower to take this mastery path. Currently, you would have to do a little bit more of that design. Um, super important to keep that content organized and sequential, and um, you can also set prerequisites and requirements in your module. Now, you say a module because mastery paths are built on a module design, content has to be a module for mastery paths to work. So, um, and the thing that teachers need to do is they set up the entire module first, right? So this particular assignment, and I honestly, obviously would never, for my student facing course, have something that said tier one, two, and three. <laughs> this is just for demonstration, right? So as the teacher, I would set up tier one resources, tier one assignment. I could have as many things as I needed to. And also, you might have things that tier two and two, tier three need to do. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it has to just be the one tier. But, but I would set up everything, okay? I, I created this tier lesson, so my kids in tier one are doing this, and they need these resources. My kids in tier two are doing this, and they need these resources. Tier three, this, and they need these resources. So I create that whole module first. So it's still the tier one, two, three is going to be based on what the pre-assessment is, not yes. that I haven't grouped any different way in terms of right. Right, right. It's just the fact that um, you know I wouldn't have those those labels for students um, to see. But the, then you create your a pre-assessment, and you set it as mastery pack, and this is where you set up. This is what I want my tier one to do, tier two to do, tier two and tier three to do. These are the point values that I've decided to align to those. Because again, all these instructional decisions are being made by the teacher, right? So whatever the total point value is of that quiz or if it's an assignment, that's going to be the top range. Zero is always going to be the bottom range. And teachers decide what are those breaking points. Is it that they have to actually have a perfect score? You know, sometimes for that top level, teachers say they have to, you know, show mastery, they have to answer every question correctly. It could be 80%, could be whatever. I'm not making that decision, but that's where teachers can make that decision. Then they go and they do the plus, and it lets them choose anything that's in that module as something that they could put into that mastery path. They could even say, this or this, so they can embed choice there. So they're differentiating even more by embedding choice. And then, as I mentioned, you can even have the same item in two of the different tiers or three of the tiers. Um, it could be that there's a culminating assignment that you want to be in all three tiers. Now, personally, I would never put the culminating assignment in the mastery path. I would just have it at the end of the module. And the reason why is, remember when I said there's a way to kind of get around the whole Power Teacher Pro thing. That would be that for, you know, I argue that the mastery path itself is part of the learning activity, right? Your students are doing things here, even if they get like some type of formative assessment embedded in an assignment and assignment score, there that's the learning. So they should not get, hey, they should not, in my opinion, <laughs> necessarily receive a graded score that goes that factors into their grade for the learning that's occurring. However, you could create just an assignment down here that does go to everyone that's going to be, okay, you've done the, your learning activities, now let's see, where are you at? This is a more you know, summative assessment. That could be assigned to everyone, not master pass, and that way that grade goes to Power Teacher Pro. So at the end of that unit, at the end of that lesson, at the end of that whatever, then they are getting a graded assignment. But I wouldn't put that one in the mastery path. Hi, Gordon. Um, so, again, super important that they set up, it has to be modules. Make sure that they set everything up first, they created those things, right? They, then they create that pre-assessment, whatever it is. Then they can set up that, that mastery path. Um, there are, you can see, you know, here's another example. It just kind of shows you a breakdown. There are also ways that you can use it for choice. But I'm going to say this is important. Okay, if you're using it as choice, 
You still have to do it based on a score on that entry event. So it's super important to communicate to students, this is a choice activity, this grade is not being factored into your grade, okay? So the way that I deal with that is, first of all, on my, um, oh, I didn't do it on this one, is you know how like when you're creating an assignment or creating a quiz, you can say, um, have them have an introduction. I could show you another one where, I show you another one where I've done it. <coughs> Sorry. I had it in here. Okay, I don't. The way I do it generally is I would create a page where I say um, this is going to be just um, a choice activity, it doesn't go into your score, just and I would put those directions right here. The other thing I do is, and you will see this here. <coughs> I have it in another course. I have a group category that I just say choice assignments that has zero weight. All right. So my assignment group, I would make sure that the assignment was living in an assignment group that was zero weight. And also, I'll put directions here to tell students this this quiz does not count towards your grade. This is just choice. And the reason why is you're going to see why is that we go to when we're looking at the questions because this particular assignment is actually something I did. I had a unit in Spanish three. It was like a cultural unit, and I wanted my students to be able to decide were they more interested in Spanish music, Spanish art, or Spanish theater. Right, independent or drama, whatever. And whatever they chose, they got to do a research project and like presentation, whatever on that. So I want them to have resources because it's going to have different resources. I'm going to give them different, you know, think, things to look at. I'm going to have different requirements based on what they're doing. Now, the standards are the same. I'm assessing them the same way because they're supposed to be learning the same thing, really. But um, I want them to be able to have the right resources. So I set it up as if they choose music, they get one point, right? If they choose art, they get two. And if they choose theater, they get three. And then I have my mastery pass set that way, right? Zero to two, which is going to be one, they get music. Two to three, which is going to be two, they get art. And then anything, you know, three over, they get theater, right? And so then they get those resources that are like that. So they are going to have to get a score for the quiz. They're going to get somewhere in that zero to six point range. It's really going to be zero to three, but it's only going to choose one. But they're going to get a score, but I don't want them to think that score is going to the correct book. So you just got to be really clear. But it's a cool way to differentiate based on choice and provide the right resources. One thing that when we first started using Canvas, um, I had teachers that did, um, you know, students were doing, um, I forget, Reader's Workshop you know, where they were all reading something different that aligned with the same topic. Um, but teachers were like struggling with, well, how do I do this? How do I have the right vocabulary list and the right comprehension questions and the right or discussion questions or whatever for my students um, when they're self-selecting those books or those reading groups? This is a great way to do it. Think about they could have all of those different resources. You could have your vocabulary, your comprehension questions, your group discussion questions, or your you know, roles that you're assigning for each of the different books or novels or studies that your book studies you're doing. Um, so super, super cool resource. It's a little bit of a hack. <laughs> you know, again, you have to do some kind of neat things to set that up, but it, um, it is a way to use it. I'm going to go look at questions, y'all, since Pam has stepped out of the room.
<laughs> uh, Jason, that's funny because I was just saying, getting ready to say, in the last few minutes, I was going to let you. I meant to do it first, but uh, since I jumped in and, and I skipped over you, I apologize, but I'm going to let you do it. So, going to grab your link. And if you are ready to talk, I'm going to go to Pam's computer in just a second and unmute you. Can you get it? Some reason. Oh, I don't have that speed. Can't get that big stand out to grab the um. Can you do another question just with the link? Thank you. Why it's not letting me copy it and draw it. I tell you what, Jay said, if you will go to the hot topics and drop it in, because for some reason it's not letting me copy it out of there. If you can go to Hot Topics and drop it in there, I'll grab it. And so, y'all, we're going to let Jason show us what he was going to share about um, Mastery Pass 2. And, Jason, I am unmuting you now. I think I am. Well... Oh, it says you're self-muted. So you could probably unmute yourself. All right. I yeah. think I'm unmuted now. Aha. Great. Thank you, Jason. I, and I do apologize. No problem. <laughs> I jumped All right. So I was just going to share some things that we're doing with Canvas as far as PD and personalized learning. Um, but in reference to a previous conversation about skits in Canvas, uh, in an earlier iteration of our Canvas training course, we built off that whole Kung Fu Canvas uh, course. And to add a little bit of interest, I did record uh, tutorial videos in front of a green screen while dressed in a ninja suit. So, uh, but thankfully- I love it. <laughs> we need to see that. You need to share uh, that. <laughs> we've retired that class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but I, those videos do exist somewhere. I, maybe I'll find one of them. Um, I know I can talk to Gina. Yes. <laughs> so, um, in terms of just the PD topics, uh, you know, I think it's pretty common that districts are using Canvas to do some uh, self-paced professional development. We have plans to offer a series of self-paced uh, one, one CEU courses coming up next year. And the topics are what I think are interesting. So we're doing everything from a Canvas course on how to use SchoolNet to how to get started with blended learning. Uh, Gina is going to do one on classroom management. Uh, but we're also lurking, uh, looking at things like how to differentiate instruction or engaging students with poverty in mind or building capacity to support students with disabilities. So uh, a wide slate of possible choices for teachers. The diagram that you're looking at right now, uh, this is sort of the, the flow map of the modules that we're creating. So I have a team that I'm working with right now to create some credit recovery courses in classes that we find ourselves needing recovery. And these modules will be used not only to do recovery at the end of a course, sort of in lieu of traditional summer school uh, in some cases, but I think more importantly and hopefully more effectively, these can be used during the teaching of the course. So let's say you're doing the unit, you're teaching world history and uh, you have a unit on ancient Egypt and your students, you have a student who just completely uh, just tanks that unit, just doesn't understand. This is a way to present that information in to teach that in a different manner than what you used in class. And uh, the idea is to have the student recover that credit during the course of the year rather than at the end, you know, just letting those bad grades wreck a student's average towards the end of the semester. So we don't have a common pacing guide uh, across our system. We have school sort of, uh, our system is 
more school centric. So schools have the ability to set their own pacing, but it's our hope in creating some uh, modules for, for instance, uh, for our English 2, which is one of the ones we're working on, we're creating modules built around standards, of course, rather than around pieces of literature that teachers will be able to use those modules. So here is an example flow map of how one of those modules works using mastery paths. So your student uh, takes the pre-assessment and we set a fairly high bar. Um, and also what we did for this pre-assessment is we're building question banks. So there may be, for instance, 40 questions in the bank. The pre-assessment is set to choose 25. Uh, student takes that pre-assessment, a score of between zero and 65 would place the student in the left-hand category, the instruction category, which is sort of starting from scratch. And this is gonna have a lot of teacher video, a lot of uh, interaction, uh, sort of interactive elements. We're hoping to create an engaging reteaching of the concept that the student did not get in the traditional classroom. A score between 70 and 85, the student falls into the practice category. This is a, a category for students who just need to mess around with the concepts some. So this is that sort of guided practice you might have in class, but it's a chance to, to work with concepts and apply them. Uh, at the end of that, there is a sort of uh, a mini performance task that uh, students will submit. And this is not, uh, at this point, everything has been objective. This one is not objectively graded. So this will require some you know, teacher touching this course at this point. And students who score well on that uh, mini task move on to the performance task, which is also where students would move who score 85 or higher on the pre-assessment. And students who do not seem to have a full mastery of the standard at that point in the practice round, go to a playlist. So this is gonna be sort of the blended learning style playlist where you'll have a series of, it allows for student choice. You'll have a series of um, you know, videos on there, also uh, text to read, uh, some online formative assessments that they can do, some manipulatives if, it, if it's appropriate to the subject matter. But this is a students get a chance to just pick and choose from this playlist as to what appeals to them and they'll have a wide range of options as they continue to practice and develop their skills. At the end of which, uh, the teacher decides when they've, they show that they now understand the material to move them onto the performance task, which is where students finally demonstrate mastery and regain the credit that they might have missed. Since this class is completely separate from power school, at this point, teachers might go back in and adjust the grades for the student in the original power school course, or you know, however it was originally done in power school. Um, and if this is a credit recovery class, then a, a full credit recovery, then it would probably be linked to power school. But um, the performance task would be really the only actual grade just to show you know to show mastery of the standard at that point i love that jason um thank you for sharing are you planning to put any of this stuff in canvas commons i mean i actually i definitely understand the amount of time investment and work that goes into it so don't <laughs> don't think it as i'm saying like this is mandatory i'm just curious if y'all um, are planning to put anything there yeah i i don't get to make that decision so I don't know what we're planning to do with it. I will say that we have created a sort of branded and honestly, I'm pretty proud of it. It's a pretty slick look to these courses. Um, all the credit recovery courses will have a very similar look and flow to them. So students, no matter what subject that they're in, when they go into one of these credit recovery courses, they should feel, if they've done one before, they should feel really familiar to them and look and navigate exactly the same. And will this program be in lieu of your APEX or Adminum or whatever you may be using? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Does Are there any online questions? No. I don't see any. Do y'all have any other questions for Jason? I do apologize for, um, I, I skipped him. You know? Oh. <laughs> But it was funny because right about the time I went to questions, I was like, I forgot to get Jason to talk. So, and, and, he had, and he had kindly said, if you're ready for me to share. If you're ready. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Definitely sharing that. That's fantastic. Not only, 
Yeah, it is important, I think, for teachers to get a taste of personalized learning and to get personalized PD. That way they understand how to do it and that it can be done when they're, you know, working with their own students because we teach the way we were taught. So we have to reteach, right, a little bit so that we give people those experiences. So I love um, using, you know, Mastery Pass or any type of personalized learning for teachers as well. But then definitely this credit recovery and, um, you know, those little short cycle credit, you know, re making up that, those skills that they've missed along the way instead of waiting till they've completely failed a course. We, we all know the value of that. So that's a great way to do that. Fantastic. Yeah, and if you even wanted to put like the template in, <laughs> in Canvas comments, I just know somebody who would help you advertise that. So, <laughs> just saying, I would, I would love to get that out. Yeah, there, there, there might be a few people who are willing to advertise. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate it. So, You're welcome. Fantastic. Um, we are um, just about at lunchtime. Y'all, for those of you, if, if you were not planning to circle back with us after lunch, I do want to just real quickly point out, um, you know, I didn't get to everything, and I knew that there was probably no way to do that, but I did put the instructor guides and I mean guides for outcomes in here for you, as well as stuff for LTI integrations, including the Go Open installation instructions. Um, I do want to talk about that specifically after lunch if we have a chance, though. Um, I also put product updates. If you haven't started using the new admin console for your support tickets, they will deprecate the old one at some point, so it's a good time to go check it out. Also, if you haven't checked out the new training portal from your help menu, we put a training portal link in all your help menus. Check that out. Upcoming changes, there are some features that are being forced in January, as well as new gradebook. And then always those release notes. And then just as a reminder, at the beginning and end of terms, check your term end dates. Make sure your teacher access dates are far enough out to give teachers the time they need to finish grading. Check your grading periods. Make sure your close dates are far enough out, enough out to give time, teachers time. And just, you know, capitalize on that opportunity at the beginning of the new semester, new open houses, to talk to parents about observer access. Um, don't forget about statewide meetings. Union County is sharing next month, y'all. She's done something really cool. Casey has you with certainly Gordon's support and Garrett's also. Um, really cool stuff with principals. And then Elizabeth Joyce is online with us now, but if you're not advertising in CAP online, it's a great way to get some free Canvas training for your teachers and your principals because we have principal courses in there now too. So please remember that. Canvas webinars, Pam and I dutifully every month. <laughs> Take a couple hours and uh, we're connecting with a ton of teachers, a ton of teachers. So make sure your teachers are being able to take advantage of that by advertising those as well. And then if you have hot topics for this afternoon, please do so. Um, there's also, not that y'all that are gonna be here this afternoon, you can wait and do feedback after, but if you're not, you can certainly do it before. And what time are we circling back, Ms. Pam? 1.50. All right, so 1.15, those of you online, if we're a couple minutes late, please hang tight. If you're coming back with us this afternoon, same link and everything. Yep. All right. Y'all have a great lunch. We'll see you just a little bit. All right. All right, let me stop the recording. Okay. Did you get it? Yep. In the slide deck, there is a link to the hot topics. I'll give everybody just a second to, ask, to put anything in there if you have something that you want to talk about this afternoon. Um, I do want to, just because there were a lot of questions about outcomes, LTI integrations, um, I do want to just circle back to those and see if there's anything specific. And then we will... Um, again, just real quick, I'll go over some of those product updates that I mentioned before lunch. And then anything else you all have um, in terms of questions or topics of discussion. Can you put the um, slide back up with the... the mm -hmm. Sure can. There we go. Lisa, we're glad to have you join us this afternoon. <laughs> so it says I don't have any audio, but I believe. No, I got it.
got it over here. Yeah, I was going to say, I believe that's because it's over there. Yeah. So, on slide five, y'all, there's a, um, just get in, there's the hot topic spreadsheet. There's anything that you wanted to discuss today or what to now. Um, did y'all both get the, um, the earlier? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So just real quick, if you guys are online, can you raise your hand if you can hear us? We just want to make sure our audio is working after lunch. Want to make sure it's not on carb overload. Okay, thank you. So we might be on carb overload, but it looks like our technology is working. Um, a Mexican place? Are you a uh, Taqueria. Taqueria something. It was really good. Like they gave us free cheese dip. Oh yeah. Oh, and that was that was like small bakeries. I mean, oh, what's my bad change name? Oh, okay. Yeah, you get you get the whole nine yards. So. Yeah, like there was like five different yeah. types of salsa, like, yeah, cheese dip, mm -hmm. limes. I mean, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry y'all. We're probably making those of you online jealous, but it was a really good lunch. <laughs> it was a really good lunch. That's the only place I know that does that. Audio is clear. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to just jump back in then. Um, and I'm going to not do full blown like walk through everything about outcomes, but I do want to take a look at it. Um, just a couple reminders. Um, I linked both the instructor and the admin guides in here. You have to add the outcomes to your instance as an admin before teachers can add them in their individual courses. Speaking specifically of, I don't have to go here now because I don't remember. Have there been updates that we need to? Mm -hmm. No, and so, so most people well already have. Yeah, most okay. people already have them probably, but it's just that I do occasionally still encounter, like when I'm training or talking about it, people who don't have them available to them, and that's because they're not in there. Um, they haven't been imported. So I do always remind them to go back to whoever their campus admin is and make sure that the North Carolina outcomes are in there. I've never heard of it. Okay. This is brand new. Okay. So you go to find, so you'll, you would go from your account. Right, so in a course or? Um, you're going to want to do it at the account level first. And my settings. Um, or add just add in and then you'll see outcomes on the side. Yeah. And then you'll go to find. And from find. Wait, one more back. Oh, okay. Outcomes and okay. a bit of fine. Okay. And then you should see, I don't know which one's going to be called or labeled, but Not either. Exactly. Okay, so you could probably go to, I'm sorry, state standards and then go to North Carolina. And you're going to want to pull in at essential standards and standard course of study. You can pull in foundations for early learning if you want to. I mean, that depends on if you're using them or not. Um, but definitely essential standards because that's going to have everything except your ELA and math. And then the standard course of study has your ELA and math. And there, you're going to see multiple versions. Um, but you're going to pull so those in. Once I'm here, do I go ahead and import or do I do everything? So you could do it. it, like if you're just now putting them in there, then I probably would actually go to the English and import from there so, so that you don't do, do the old ones. Uh -uh, you can do it just from right there. Uh, that way, and also same thing for math, that way you don't pull in the old ones because there's no sense in you pulling in old ones at this point. Now, for essential standards, you could just pull, do it from the essential standards folder. So just from that level. But for the standard course of study ones, because you have so many old ones in there, old sets, I wouldn't do this whole standard course of study folder. Does that make sense? But yeah, so once they're imported into your instance, then your teachers can import them into their courses. And they can, and they can import just the specific grade level. Now, the important thing to know is that if you import them, these come from um, CERCA, academic benchmarks, they're going to come in exactly the way they are there, and they're not editable. So that means that um, you know, language is what it is. It's exactly how the standards are written. It's not IPAN statements. You know. um, it also, they come in with um, calculation for the learning mastery grade book on your outcomes is based on the highest score. Canvas itself allows for calculation to be on highest score, 
um, average, I think, um, the decaying average, um, number of times assessed. It has a, a bunch of different ways that you could actually calculate a learning mastery score for a student based on an outcome. But the way they import from Certica is highest score. So that's the way these are going to be. The other thing is um, that it comes in with three levels, which are going to be the meets, does not meet, and exceeds, and a five-point scale. Okay? So all of them are going to import that way. And I'm going to show you one. I'm going to drill down into, um, let's see, I'll drill down into world languages. So as I keep continuing drilling down, I'm going to get all the way to that clarifying objective. As I get to that clarifying objective, then that's where you're going to see it's got the three levels, exceeds, meets, does not meet, and the calculation method is highest score. That's the way all these import. Now, I have teachers who say, first of all, if you want to do district level outcomes reports, people need to be using the ones you've imported at the district level. So if you can create proficiency scales at the district level because you also, in addition to the ones that we have made available for you from Certica, you also can, at any level, um, go back. you also can, and I, I did this based on <clears throat> something Johnson County was doing, because they're working on creating their own proficiency scale. So you can see that they've taken that standard, they put in you know, the previous prior grade level, the next grade level, um, and put it there. And then they've written their own objectives or standards and I can statements and put it in a 3 2 1 scale. And I put it with a 65% decayed average. So you can do the work as a district of creating the district yourself. You can actually create them directly in the interface. So you see there plus group. That would be obviously if you were going to group them. And then you see plus outcome when you're actually creating the outcome itself. Or you can import them via CSV file, which is really nice. Um, and actually, Gordon here in Eden County has been working on doing that for CTE standards. So, thank you for that. Yeah. So like he and I did the, or he, he did most of the work. Let's see. Oh, we actually had, maybe we just set up the folders. But the, we imported these, what we did based off of, um, from a CSE file. So he was set, working to set that up. Because if you know, North Carolina, there we go, doesn't have um, CTE standards loaded in academic benchmarks to start again. So there's no way for us to pull them in. So Gordon was working on trying to get it started getting it in here, which would be great work to share. <laughs> you know, like he's already got the format of the CSV file. You, you certainly can see how the folders have to be nested. Um, but yeah, it'd be great work to share. Um, so we have here um, just an example of them. These are ones he created and he imported the CSV file. Um, so you can do that. Especially, like I said, if you're working on creating, you know, some district level proficiency standards um, or and some learning targets and writing them in ICANN segments, kid friendly language. Um, let's see. So, going into a course, I'm just going to play with this one. So, if I'm a teacher now in my course, I need to go in and import them. All right, so I'm going to go in to do outcomes. I'm going to find, I'm going to go to account standards. Oops. <clears throat> and I'm going to go into, because I am math, I'm going to go to that folder. And um, it was math one. So I need to import all my math one standards. So I import them there. Okay, so that gave me in my course now all of those. I'm going to delete this test import. Just did that as an example. Or something. All right, so now as a teacher, I have Math 1 standards in my course. So when 
if I wanted to, I would be able to look at my students' progress towards mastery via the Learning Mastery Gradebook. I'm going to show you a course that has it in there. Also, when I, I could create rubrics, and I could create rubrics to use over and over and over and over again in my course, or I could create them to be specific for one assignment. This is going to be an example of one that I would do over and over again. And I don't know what to name it. I should have done more languages so I have more context for you, but <laughs> I'm just going to do that. I would find my outcome and I would decide what is something I'm going to assess over and over throughout this course. Right? And I'm going to drill down to that clarifying objective and I'm going to say import that. And I would continue to find those objectives, those standards. I want to delete this one. that one that I'm going to use for this. Okay, these are both about quadratic equations, right? So let's just pretend that those are everything on my kids were doing quadratic equations that I wanted to assess for. Uh, but obviously it's not, but I could put all of those objectives that align to that that I was going to assess. And so then every time we were doing something working with those quadratic equations or quadratic expressions, then I could use this rubric to assess it and attach this rubric to the assignment. Then, based on whatever their scores are on each individual uh, outcome, then it would inform that learning mastery gradebook. You could also create question banks. Okay, you can also create question banks that are going to be aligned to specific outcomes. And then, once again, as you are assessing, then all of the questions that you put in this question bank, when you add any of those questions to a quiz, it's going to inform that learning mastery score. Um, also, with our new quizzes, <laughs> when you create a new quiz, now, this probably is not going to show for me right now because <coughs> um, when you, <coughs> usually it takes a couple, like 24 hours before I've just imported these outcomes into this course, so I'm probably not going to be able to put them in my quiz yet but we're going to try. <laughs> so with a new quiz, when I create a question, pretend I have a question there. <laughs> I can go in and I can align that to an outcome. I'll say, oh, yay. Sometimes it, no, nah, see, it just has the ones that I deleted. But let's pretend that like I had waited 24 hours that I would be able to go in and choose the outcomes and hit OK. And it would align that question to the outcome. And then I would also see that when I looked at reporting. So I'm going to go in and actually show you an example to give you a little more context. Show you a better example. So, when we look at outcomes, I have my world language outcomes in here. I actually put too many because I would not have all of these in one class, but I only have to put the ones that pertain to my, that level, right? Then you're going to see I've done like listening because I'm going to assess listening activities over and over again throughout my Spanish class. And no matter what the listening activity it is, I'm not assessing them to say that they say that the correct answer was Pablo, right? I'm saying, are they recognizing those signals like, words and simple memorized phrases in the media. All right, so each time that I'm assessing them on a listening activity, I'm assessing these particular skills. So I'm going to use this rubric over and over. Um, also, in my quizzes, I've created question banks, or a question bank at least, um, aligned to this particular standard. 
So every time I create a classic quiz, because y'all know we have classic quizzes and new quizzes, every time I create a classic quiz, I can align it to, um, or I can pull in those questions aligned to this outcome. And then those are going to feed my learning mastery <coughs> scores for my students. So when I go to my grade book, I can look at my learning mastery grade book. I can even hide outcomes with no results. And then I see how are my students doing? What is their level of mastery on each of these particular outcomes from my courses that I've already assessed? So I can pull groups that way, you know, I can design some, um, you know, uh, reteaching, remediation um, activities, some enrichment activities based on where, how my students have performed in the past as I've assessed them. Also, we're going to look at a new quiz to show you what a new quiz looks like. So with the new quizzes, you can see I've aligned these questions to different outcomes. Some of these y'all I was just playing with on a training the other day, so it looks they look bad. <laughs> I did have it where it was only things I had actually assessed and real real outcomes. Um, but you can see that these when I, so far for what I ass, uh, assessed, um, my students have demonstrated the these this level these levels of mastery right on those particular outcomes. So I can see which students I still need to work with. So any questions about outcomes? I know we've talked about these, um, you know, maybe a couple times in the past. I just want to make sure since they were, um, that was like a very popular topic on the feedback form. I want to make sure any questions that you have have been answered. There can be a lot of quizzes. Hmm? There can be a lot of assignments. Um, okay, so the way that you would align it to an assignment is through a rubric. So, like, let's say for this one, so this is an, a listening, an actual listening activity. So I just pulled in that rubric that I use for listening activities. <coughs> now, I could also create one on the fly here for an individual assignment. Let's still go back to the reporting. Yeah. As long as, as long as when you create the rubric or do a find outcome, then it'll go back to that reporting. Yeah. <clears throat> Good question. I mean, you know, when we talk about, there's so much discussion of, you know, competency-based ed and standards-based grading, and then some people get scared about when you start talking this way, they think you're going to force them to standards-based grading. It doesn't mean you have to be standards-based grading system to be, like, you know, standards-aligned instruction and assessment. Um, our learning mastery grade, grade book doesn't feed back to power school. So just because, you know, the students are seeing that learning mastery grade or teachers are seeing that learning mastery grade, that doesn't mean that's the grade they want to power school. Teachers are still deciding what grades are going to power school because they're putting them in the actual grade book. Now, different teachers do that different ways if they are trying to be truly a mastery-based approach. And that's a discussion that no. the principal, yeah. the instructional coach, the instructional coach, <laughs> uh, that's a discussion that has to happen there. Do, the, do teachers truly have an understanding of what it means and how they should be, what grades should be reported off of this? Um, you know, and I do have a session, a, a, a Canvas course um, that actually, I'll, I'll drop it also in the presentation that I did a lot of discussion. I'd actually did it at CCES last year on standards based grading and what does it really look like? Um, because it's not just that. You know, learning mastery grade book, you've got to actually think about how are you going to design mm -hmm. your actual grading system. But I did like so all the. don't put that much thought into what they're doing. Like, uh, it's just a, it, it's a big discussion, mm -hmm. right? So I'll go ahead and drop that in there. Ooh. Also, for you. I remember. Uh, okay, I can't. I'll have to do it later. I'll put it in chat and then I'll put it, I'll give it to you all later. I'm not signed in to this one, so I can't get it in there. <laughs> That's why. So, any questions about outcomes or any other discussion? Uh, let's see. I might have a question. Do you add a question back for a teacher the same way you do outcomes, more or less? 
Um, so as a teacher, you can, when, as you build quizzes, you can add questions to question banks. Um, also, so there's two different processes. Um, one is if you're doing classic quizzes, which by the way, they're really trying to get feedback on new quizzes. There's two things that Canvas, our, our product team, our developers are really looking for feedback on. One is new quizzes, and the second is learning mastery gradebook. If you have any feedback to share on either of those things, it would be a great time to give it to me um, or Jamie, um, if you work with Jamie more, because they're asking, like, you know, we're getting ready, hopefully, to move at some point from classic quizzes to new quizzes entirely. So what would it take? Like, what are those features that are still missing that are keeping your teachers on the old quizzes? That's one thing. And then just with learning mastery, I mean, not with learning mastery, it was speed grader. That's a learning mastery grader, but I'm a speed grader. With speed grader, which is what are those things that the teachers, you know, would like to see in development with speed grader. All right, so um, let me get back to this. question banks. As you build a question bank, or as you build quizzes, those questions go into like an unfiled question bank. So you can always add them to a question bank. I like to create question banks um, that are aligned to specific outcomes. That way, when I'm creating spiral reviews or, um, sorry, I'm making go to quizzes, or um, you know, end of course reviews, I could, it's easily, or it's really easy to pull questions from multiple question banks. So we're being a little slow this afternoon. So you can see that I've got, um, when I go to my question banks, I've got some unfiled questions. And that's what happens when you're just creating quizzes and you don't have any questions. Um, so basically, once I did, this would have text in it if they were real questions or obviously things I've just done demoing. But once you do, you can just move questions. So like whether you're doing it by topic or whether you're naming it you know, by the standard, but you can move and copy questions um, to those question banks. Uh, you also can add a question bank here, or let's see, that's add a question. Let me go to back one level. Um, let me get a question banks. I can add a question bank, um, name it whatever I'm naming it, open it, and then you add your questions that way. So again, you can either do it based on questions you already have, or you can do it based on um, uh, creating them directly in the question bank. Now that's for classic quizzes. For um, new quizzes, I love the way that new quizzes allows you to share question banks. You can just go in and add somebody's name to share a question bank with them. And now we would both have editing rights to that question bank. Like it's that easy. Um, really, really like that. So as you know, I'm adding, uh, and I just added all those questions to this question bank, which I did not mean to do. <laughs> but as I added those, then um, or I'm adding questions that, to my item bank, then she can continue um, adding them also. All right, so let me look at, there's a couple of questions. Um, darling, there's not really, I mean, so the good, short answer is no, that there's not really a way to duplicate a question. Now you can duplicate a quiz um, in your modules. Okay, I think you can. It's moving really slow for us. Um, actually, I can't duplicate it. Sorry about that. I knew that when they did duplicate, there was one thing that could, you couldn't duplicate, and it is the quiz. Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, you can't duplicate a question. Um, let's see, Jason. Step outcomes. One assessment, breakdown results by standard. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, if you're using new quizzes, absolutely, Jason. You can just, for each question, 
it can be aligned to a different, see these are aligned to different um, outcomes. And so for each, it's gonna basically, the report is gonna to to be like the cumulative result of all of the questions aligned to each outcome. You're gonna see that mastery score. So absolutely exactly what you were saying, you can do. You can um, use new quizzes to create one assessment that would break down results by standard. Um, so you can have three to four standards, right? And have multiple questions. But yeah, Darlene, sorry about that. that you can't um, duplicate those questions. So you do have to um, build them individually, both with old quizzes and new quizzes. One thing I'll point out about new quizzes, not that it's come up or been asked, but um, one of the features that's still lacking is that with um, matching with classic quizzes, it gives partial credit. So, you know, a lot of teachers use mass matching for set of vocabulary. So they might have 10 items and the question might be worth 10 points, but it's really doing one point per item. Um, in new quizzes, it still counts at all or nothing. Um, so that is one thing. If you have a teacher that uses lots of matching, I would say that we're not ready for that yet. All right, I'm gonna move on to LTI integrations unless there's anything else about outcomes. So LTI integrations, the best place to find the ones that are actually available is EduApp Center. Now within Canvas, you can also see some, but this is like, I feel like this is just a better, better maintained resource. And it has the specific directions for each LTI or each external tool. Within Canvas, sometimes I find that the information is just, it's so short and succinct, it doesn't have all the directions that you need. But the EduApp Center has everything. And it'll show you, you can filter it, you can search by lots of different um, factors and you can find all of the different LTIs that you can integrate into Canvas. Now, these external tools are built by third parties. They're not built by Canvas. So when you see that there are like different ways that you go about adding them, then that's because that's the way they built them, right? And so, some are built has to be per course. And then some you can do like, so if you think about something that would have like a teacher's credentials versus a district credential, then then yes, it needs to be added at the course level, even if you've added it at the district level. Is Flipgrid one of those examples we're thinking about? I think that's I think that's true. I think Flipgrid <laughs> has to be added um, at the course level, whereas there are some things that have to be added at the district level, like SchoolNet has to be added at the district mm -hmm. level. Go Open NC is going to have to be added at the district level. Um, even like Badger Pro can be added at the, at the um, teacher or school level, but I really like having it at the school level or at the district level. So, but you're going to find all of those examples. Like I'm going to show you Badger Pro, or not Badger Pro, just Badger. All right, so it goes through and it tells you exactly what it is, tells you like there are some pro options, um, tells you that it's free if you're just using the, the plain one, gives you the how to add it to the course or the account, and it gives you even a checklist. Now, not everything has these examples. It's such a great, you know, well-developed format, but I think Badger does a good job telling you how to do it. But I'm just going to show you, for instance, I'm not logged into my account. Um, in Badger, I have to find the key and secret myself in my Badger account, right? Yeah. So here it is. This is a screenshot. So I have to go to Badger, log in, and find my key and secret. That's going to be the case with most LTIs. So most of them are going to say, you add it through a configuration URL and you're going to have to have your key and secret. Well, you get all three of those things from that app. Like here, I go to Badger and I find it. Or I go to McGraw-Hill or I go to, you know, whatever it is, and I've got to find that information to add it into Canvas. But there are lots of different tools that you can use. Again, the Edgy App Center is fantastic. Um, and it's a, you know, really well organized or easy to sort and filter and search to find the types of tools that you're looking for. So there, I put the instructor guides for how teachers do it. 
as well as admin guides here um, for you all. And then I wanted to talk about Go Open NC because um, you were just given this week the installation instructions for Go Open NC. And hopefully, Pam, when she sets back in, can speak more to one part of those instructions you received. But these are the directions for installing basically if they're like generic, like Go Open NC. The directions we were sent via email said if you would like to have a local resource group contact, and it gave you an email to contact. So if you want a local, like LEA level resource group, then contact that email. I'm sure it's her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but to contact her via that email, and she said that she, they would set you up with a local resource group to get to. But if you're not worried about doing the local one, then you just use the ones that are that are given via these installation instructions. Okay. Um, and when this kind of shows you how you do it, like what it looks like. Right, so the teachers, this is what they're, it looks like when they're searching. So she gives you, here's the key, the secret, and the launch URL that you have to have. The way that you add it, I'm going to add it to mine because I'm not even adding it to mine. I did. I did get this. Let's see if they, they let me add it. You know, sometimes I have permission to do stuff and sometimes I don't. I don't know what you have to how how you have to be um, authenticated in. You know, I'm not yeah. a I don't have a uh, North not Carolina. A yeah. So let's go to settings. So we'll just do this together. So could we put this in our sandbox? I mean, in our um, beta beta. That's what Casey was asking. Yeah. Well, they told us. Let's wait till she gets back in here and ask okay. for that. Because originally they told us not to put it in beta. Oh really? So I'm going to go, I'm following directions just because I know what they say, <laughs> but um, all right, so it tells me to do that and that, and then I need to go find that. See, I got the key. I need to get the secret. All right, and then now I need to get the configuration URL. And see, this is what this is said, instructions yeah. tell you to do. Mm -hmm. So I did it by URL. So uh, it said you couldn't go forward if you wanted your own little local thing. All right, here's, this is interesting. This is the one that's set for the configuration. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> we get error messages from the new website. Oh no, I'm, 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 I'm getting ready to put this, but I just noticed that the low launch, the launch URL and the configuration URL are different. So yeah. when they set it up, they're going to have to use the configuration URL. So. Okay. So now, in a course, I should be able to. Go and test it. I'm gonna find a test course. I test lots of stuff. <laughs> lots of stuff. We're gonna do it as an assignment. I think I've always done it as an external tool, but okay. Um, okay. I was going to do it as an external tool assignment, but. Oh, okay. I haven't tried that yet. Go ahead and try it and see if it works. <laughs> I think I did it before. Okay. I mean, I think it should work, but. But it, it would make sense. It'd have to be an assignment for it to even make sense, though, the right? Like. Well, no, because we had, like, some. Uh, I didn't think it was going to let me. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Carol? Okay. I'll log in. Um, I was like, I, I said, let me see if I can get it to work around. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so let's say it was a reading passage or something. And, you know, you, it could even be something that the kids weren't even getting graded on, but it could still be an assignment, right? Like it's a do. You want it to populate on the calendar. You want it to populate. Um, I remember on their to-do list. Yay! And you want to look for some stuff since you know what's good that you can find and show? Sure. Thanks. No, because um, how I'm always
always done it is just as an external tool and allows you to select. Okay. And then it comes up. Okay, so go back to the module, just add it as an external tool. Okay. This is good to that. Yeah. And so, so rating. Yeah. You should be able to go to share. It, um, it's behaving a little different for you than it is for me. Can I just go into mine? Yep. So you can just go to the top and add a new tab and do the MCD for that. Right. So it's supposed to kind of look like this when it's saved. So that way the student can see. So let me go. Yeah. All right, there we go. And so you have your collections. So, you know, teachers can go. Now, nah, and you can search resources here. So. And then you can, you know, maybe someone to look primary. All right, so I can preview it. So I'll open it up in the new tab. Or I can just say select. And then now when a student clicks on that resource, it'll be there kind of embedded for them. So a couple things. One to think about is, you know, teachers can add things like this, which is more of a lesson plan, mm -hmm. and not publish it, right? So it's still there as a teacher resource. Um, but then the things that need to be added as student resources, they would then publish, right, right. for a student view. Let me go look at those flexbooks. Right. So, so here's the flexbook. You know, I wanted my students to be able to go through this flexbook. They can do that right here. So super exciting in terms of the amount of resources that are, you know, now going to be available to teachers to pull in directly into Canvas. And there were, I mean, NC Lore was similar, right? But we also know that it was clunky and a lot of, mm -hmm. we just had a lot of a hard time with adoption. This looks very nice. <laughs> this is not, you know, as clunky. Um, although that was great work and it was great thought and help design, you know, all this stuff. This is, so you don't think, so, uh, so I'm thinking like, so where do kids need to be able to do that? You know, I mean, am I, can I give them instructions somewhere? Can I, I mean, can it be a page and then part of that LT in there? Or, or what so that I need to play with it because I thought okay. that I could put it in an assignment, but let's try it in yeah. the yeah. Let's do it next time. I just feel like, yeah. one, like in an assignment, I had went to, you were able to do an assignment in the edit mm -hmm. and went to mm -hmm. the external tool, mm -hmm. which, right, you know, um, and then it pulled in, and I was able to just click on mm -hmm. the Go Open LTI, and then when I pull it up, it gives like all these different things that you can click on. And so then I could see which one I wanted, it let me review them, and then I just added it in, and then I'm not clicking them off. 
Yeah, I was because something how I'm sure it's because I'm not really an LEA or something. Why it's not looking right in mine? Just kidding. Yeah. And so she didn't. So I just went up to the beam. tool type. She just did it there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I went there. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And here it comes up, uh -huh. and it'll tell you these different things. So then you can go and do your search over there to the side and filter stuff. And then you can give the kids directions, and they can yes. still submit in Canvas here. Right. Um, the submission type, external tool. Um, invasive. Oh, I was going to ask you that. Is there still an issue with? Didn't we? Didn't they tell us not to put invasive when we very first? Yes, they did tell us not to put invasive. Mm -hmm. So should they? Should they not put invasive? Because that was our question. No, I think it should be good now. Okay, you should be. Good. So if you want to put invasive again? Yeah. I know, do know she didn't want it in production yet. She wanted to look at it first. Um, you can, no, no, no. go it. ahead and put it in production. It should be in production. Yeah. Go ahead and put it in production. Yeah, I saw it in production. I think it was uh, just don't, easy to want Just don't tell me that. That's what I was like. Yeah, yeah. Casey uh, wanted to see it in beta. Uh, so she'd ask her to put it in beta. I think the problem with beta is just um, they weren't sure because it hadn't been tested in it. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but I saw it in the production. But I mean, yeah, you can do it that way or. Um, but like I think you know, especially. I don't think I don't think doing a submission type of an external tool would work because the, these resources yeah, are was, are supposed. To, so the icon is going live for staff. It's not going live for students. Mm -hmm. So teachers can go in here and take content and put it in their courses, but it's not necessarily something for students to be able to go look and do. Does that make sense? But they can use it. But they can they can view resources that have been vetted in Canvas. Okay. But they're not going to be able like if they to try to yeah. yeah if they try to go click on it and you know like to view resource I, as a student I wouldn't be able to because the NCS cloud is we have only active for so students won't be able to view the resource if it's a student facing resource yes. Okay. But not like lesson plans. Like the first gotcha. one I click in here gotcha. with a lesson plan, that's not gotcha. student facing. Is there something in there that tells them what student facing, uh -huh. what's not cool? Yep. So when you, um, if you go in there and create uh, something in the open authoring tool, mm -hmm. there's a little box that says is a student facing. Awesome. And so you can say yes, and then you know that would work. But yeah, so the students not going there to find resources. No, we've found right. something right. that we've added. Right. Be embedded in in mm -hmm. inside, right in our course or right. as an external URL right for them to be able to use the resource. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Right. I concur. And we, we and you know, it was also like that too because we didn't want them to be like be able to go into the lesson plan and like see the answer key or something. Right. Like that. Right. <laughs> like that. You know oh, how, yeah. how how smart they are. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's probably still some way they could find it somewhere, but. <laughs> I don't put it, I don't I don't underestimate any of our students capabilities. <laughs> yeah. They're smart little birders. So I would say it's like great, like real project based or problem based learning, right? When they figure out how to hack something, they right. so real world. <laughs> real world problem, real world real world solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I'm glad you were able to come in and show it right at the right time. Right, yeah, that worked out. Yeah. Does anybody have questions not only about this one but also about SchoolNet, the SchoolNet integration? Somebody was having kind of problems. Yeah, mm -hmm. somebody was. I just got had a question last week. They asked him, "Is it still working?" That uh, they worked with Gordon or something. They couldn't make it work. I was like, "It's working." Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Joan and I just talked and she, at lunch and she said she hearing it fine. Yeah. So I hadn't heard anything either. Like, okay, let's walk. Can you walk through something? Yep. Okay. Because um, they, I mean, really, last week they were like, "There's something wrong with this because we can't get something." Like, All right, so I'm gonna navigate away from this one, and we'll come back to school next. So I have linked the whole folder here for y'all um, of how to add school net. So there's. Um, LMS integration canvas. One thing I would say is it tells you to do this very first step to get okay. this client ID and see key and secret. This is not how you find it. 
because you don't have that those permissions. So what you do is you file a ServiceNow ticket uh -huh. with SchoolNet, and then they send you this key in secret. Yep. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we already had it set up before. You don't need to do it okay. again. So that's the only thing is I would say, I actually probably need to do something to like kind of write over this. Um, but yeah, so you do a ServiceNow ticket. So if you don't have SchoolNet already connected, then that's how you're gonna get that. Um, and then, you know, just like the other, oops, I was gonna say it. I know there's more pages, where are they at? It says there were problems loading the other pages. Let me see if I can get them to load now. Okay. But it's basically the exact same process we just yeah. walked through. Mm -hmm. Once you get the key, key and secret configuration URL from SchoolNet, you go to your Canvas account and you go to add apps and do the same thing. Um, so where I was there, settings, apps, I would go to view app configurations, add an app. It's going to tell me to do it by URL. And then I would say SchoolNet. And then I'll put that key secret and configuration URL. Um, go ahead. Did you? Oh, I thought I, heard, I, thought I heard no, you ready. Sorry. Um, so then from there, um, there are, and there's also video show, uh, but then there's also directions for how to link an actual assessment from school night <laughs> in the Canvas. Something that's important to note is once you do this and students start taking it in Canvas, they cannot go back to SchoolNet and take it. So if you have, for whatever reason, let's say two kids, this should never happen, but let's just pretend it does. You got two brand new kids in your class and they have SchoolNet access and not Canvas, but your kids are taking the assessment in Canvas, the kids who were in SchoolNet but not Canvas wouldn't be able to get into SchoolNet. That should never happen because basically once they get into power school, they should be in both systems. But I'm just saying, like if there were ever a reason that somebody didn't have Canvas access, you would have to create a new school net assessment for them. Okay. I don't know why these pages aren't loaded, but I'm not going to worry about it. Just trust me. <laughs> the directions are here and it does launch that school net assessment directly in Canvas. It also passes the grade back to Canvas. So this is, um, you know, SchoolNet itself, you have the option of choosing to send the grade to PowerSchool directly. But think about this. If you do the SchoolNet assessment in Canvas, then that grade goes to the Canvas gradebook. And if you're doing PowerTeacher Pro grade card pass back, it goes to the PowerSchool gradebook as well. So you're putting it in both places. Which um, ones if you send it? If you, if you set up the school net assessment and don't check, check the go to Power Teacher Pro, then it wouldn't do it twice. So you wouldn't do it through school. Then. Right, right. And just actually say don't check it. Yeah, 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 yeah. right, it. right. So it would do it through Canvas instead, yeah. but then it would be in both places. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. yep. But if, if we want them taking a grade. Yeah. yeah. If you want them taking a grade, right. And if it's That's a district right. benchmark, yeah. you don't want that happening. So. <laughs> but it just knows if it's a district benchmark, that means every. Everybody's got to do it Canvas. Right. Everybody doing school net because that's right. what. Mm -hmm. I just jumped on that bandwagon and then realized, oh, all yeah, the everybody have to do has it. it. So, so some people can't do it. No, in school net. It's all of what. Yeah, everyone has to take it. If it's a state of assessment. Uh huh. So what? So oh, what you can do is that. make a copy of that assessment. Yeah. And say Canvas option, and that copy of the assessment you schedule for Canvas. But then you still have a school net version, so that way everyone else who wants to take it. But then that's going to give you two tests to look at. Yeah, right? still collect all the, the data from school net until the segregation. Uh huh. Yep. So the nice thing about linking it in a Canvas course is that you still get all the data from all the reporting that school net provides. You still get all of that. It's just an easier access point. You know, yeah. if you already drive your instruction through Canvas. And you don't have to give the kids the code because uh -huh. you're you've already connected it. Yeah, so. you just link it and they go. So it's a nice access point. My virtual teachers really liked it because it was harder for them to use SchoolNet because they were having to figure out a way to share those codes with kids in their virtual classes. Uh -huh. So they really liked the the SchoolNet integration. They actually probably saw adoption there the quickest in terms of this integration. So yeah. Any other questions about LTIs, school nets, open or go open and see? Um, 
my folder for SchoolNet is um, located here on slide 12. It's SchoolNet, um, and it just should open right there. Oh, I see. <laughs> you already answered it. Sorry. <laughs> oh, funny. See, I'm not paying close enough to <laughs> All right. Let's just real quick. Um, new admin console. If you haven't yet seen it, this is what it looks like. Um, the you used to get to. Um, I was going to say two cases by going to cases, but that's true. You got to your support cases by going to cases.canvaslms.com, you know, as the field admin. Now you go to adminconsole.canvaslms.com, and that's the new face, the new console. Um, if you're a tier one client, then you have the opportunity to update your knowledge base right there. Um, if you're not tier one, you don't have to worry about that. It gives you, this is just a really good resource showing you everything about it. I wanted to specifically point out um, that when you want to escalate a case, I'm looking for that. There's some of the reporting that you get in the new console. Um, let me, does anybody care if I log in and then that's down? Kevin, do you care if I log in and cheat? No, Where well, I have to go. Are you, you so I think this is SCSNC.instruction.com. Oh, so yeah. it should say, but it should pull us out in the camera. I don't know why I didn't from that. <laughs> Guess there's just two things. All right, so I'm going to go to. You have to click on the right one before me to get this upper, like this little bar up here. I can't do it from every single place you're blue. I have to go to the right blue. All right, so this Canvas I've been called console is going to be the new one for me. Instructional support would have been old, but I'm going into the new one. This is what it looks like. So, and if you wanted to go back to the classic interface, you could go there. Y'all are just getting to it by going to adminconsole.canvaslms.com. I can create a new case here. So you see that I can do subject description, um, my perceived severity. I do want to note that this escalate to end structure is not yet showing up right now. Yeah. Well, you know, and I like this because it's nice. I, I used it a lot because technically, do I feel like something's an emergency? Sometimes I do, but can I still do go about my business? Yeah, mm -hmm. I can get it done. I mean, I have to work around it, but I can get it done. So, I mean, I, I kind of liked it, but this um, Escalate <laughs> to Canvas, and I've used that before, y'all, <laughs> but this Escalate to Instructor does, is not currently working right there. Now, we, there is a way to Escalate, but it's just not working right. This button's not working yet. Um, you also, all of you all can chat support. You also can call support, well, as field admin. If you're a field admin for the account, you can call support and you can chat support. Um, those are great ways to get questions answered quicker, right? So they're going to be a lot quicker than creating a case. You can see all of your cases. So that I logged in, when I logged into admin console, I was on home, but I can see all the cases by going to cases. You can see all open cases. You can filter it by whatever you want to filter, and you can even pin a view if you wanted to pin a view. But so you can see all of these open cases. Let's say that I wanted to go to this one and um, decided that I wanted to escalate it to Instructure. Um, so we'll have to, you know, this is probably something that is a different issue, wouldn't be escalated. But let's say that Kevin decided he wanted to escalate this one to Instructure, then he would go to Case Actions and see it says Escalate. When you click Escalate, it's going to ask you a couple questions. Basically, it's going to ask you what have you already done, like what, is, what are the steps you've taken, and then I'm not going to continue doing this because it's going to try to, you know, it would try to submit it. Plus, if these are required, so it wouldn't. But then I hit next, and then it would escalate to instructor support. As I said earlier, don't spin your wheels. If there's something that you don't have the time to troubleshoot and or you've spent five minutes trying to troubleshoot it, you don't know what to do, escalate it. I mean, that's what support's there for. Right? It's part of what North Carolina contract pricing pays for is your 24-7 support. Utilize that 24-7 support. Um, and if you need the 24-7 phone number support, 
or support number, I can give it to you too. Um, I don't know it readily off the top of my head, but I do know that you can chat right here all the time. <laughs> so that is a new, um, I'm gonna log out, so I'm gonna say log in as Kevin. There we go. Um, but you can um, always go to that. Sorry, I had that one. You can always utilize that. And the I don't know when the old one is going to go away, the old interface, but it will eventually go away. So, um, let's see. Darlene's asking. Okay, I'm going to. I just, got her. Okay, I'm going to call it out for them just in case they would have that question. So if. Um, so basically on the LTI directions, it says to complete the steps by the 16th. Um, as soon as you complete the steps, technically people can go and add things to the, from go open and see, and that's fine. We're just not publicizing it until the 16th because that's our official launch oh, date. Yeah. But it's not a big deal if, so, if you have an, an adventurous teacher that's like, oh, let me click on this, it's new, and yeah. it goes and finds it. Um, the site's live, everything works, it's past the QA, it's past our accessibility checkers. We're just kind of got all the publicity and, and communications pointed to the 16th. So that's why we're just saying that. Yeah. But so we're, all, we're all systems go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <coughs> all right, so we also have a new training portal. And so here's a little blog post about it. Um, basically, just to give you a little background, um, when you first joined Canvas, you may remember that you had probably either unlimited subscription training or a 20 person subscription training. Um, depending on what you purchased, you had one or the other um, for a year. Those were mostly all live webinars that people could register for. Um, it's very difficult for anybody, any of us, especially teachers though, to attend live trainings during the day, right? So, I mean, you know, maybe aligned with the planning periods, but probably not. So there's been a big push to move towards on-demand recorded sessions. And so as the training team is working to change that, um, that format to an on-demand training, they decided, well, let's go ahead and just make some stuff live forever or on-demand for everybody not just those people who have paid. And you can always purchase paid training subscription. It's not just that you get it the first year, it's just that most people when they onboard have it included that first year. But they decided let's just have it be available for everybody, part of it. And there's still gonna be a ton of stuff that's not available to you unless you pay for it. And there's also still gonna, there are still gonna be some live trainings because sometimes people want to have that interaction with a live trainer. Um, but what you should see is in your, Canvas account as of like a couple weeks ago. As of a couple weeks ago, you should see in your help menu, you should now see a training services portal. And that is going to ask you to authorize, you know, kind of to authenticate. It's got a two, little tutorial. I'm not going to watch that. But then I'm going to, yours may not have that first tab. Yours may just go directly into this. It's going to have a learner library for you. And so depending on what your access is and what you have, you know, again, if you've purchased or not, you'll see the things that you have available to you and your teachers. So you can preview, like here's a pathway, takes about an hour, right? How to get ready for K-12 for opening day, right? So it's giving them just really quick, you see 17 minutes, 16 minutes, 15 minutes, 12 minutes, right? On how to get ready, get their Canvas course ready for, and they get, if they've completed all four path, all four courses of pathway, then they get a certificate upon completion. So you could even decide if you wanted to that for the things that were available <clears throat> that you were going to give some district credit for if you wanted to and what that looked like. How do we know if we um, have purchased something, how do we see the difference and like, how, 
if I, because I've been working with somebody about purchasing, but I don't know where the district is with finance and all that. I'm actually getting it done. How would I know when I live um, here? You probably wouldn't have live trainings if you have not purchased anything yet. I mean, I can tell you, I could go and look, but I'll pause the, or I could freeze the screen and tell you if something's been done. Oh, it's fine. You don't have to do it right now. It's just Okay. But yeah, I would, in addition to the fact that, you know, you're going to have limited amounts of things available here, most probably, like, or if you, I don't think there's any live training that's part of a free. Does that make sense? Um, so but you see here some of the live trainings are available. So course design. You know, there was Yay, some Tracy, you just made my life so much easier. <laughs> yeah. So my, my next thing I've got to develop. So right now I have a smart rock star course. We have Office 365 rock stars course. And so Canvas is coming up on my radar. So, and part of what we did in the other courses was, you know, I didn't create content. I had them go through the content and get the certificates and upload them yeah. into my course. So yeah. this is... And y'all know we have Roll with Canvas that's available. Mm -hmm. what? Roll yeah, with yeah, Canvas. yes. Yeah, there's, oh, I know I was going to start with some of that too. There's a student getting started course now. It's called like Passport or something, and that's available in Commons. You know, there's a Be the Hero admin course. So if you mm -hmm. have a district where you have multiple Canvas admin, like let's say you had an ITF at every school that you wanted to be a Canvas admin, you could <laughs> put in your Be the Hero <laughs> and let them be um, your Canvas admin at some level, whether you wanted to customize that permission or not. Um, I also wanted to point out Canvas Net. These are free MOOCs, y'all, that teachers can enroll in. So if you decided to, and they're different, like there's blended learning series, um, there's a uh, Learn Canvas series, education reform series. So it's not just Canvas, although, you know, there are, like there's that Passport to Canvas, and that's in the MOOC. But, um, so there's those available as well. Did you take some of those MOOC? Can you get those from the MOOC and put it into our instance? Um, no, but they might be in they might, they be, might in, be in ours. Yeah, yeah. They might be in uh, Commons if I am. Yeah, I so that would be. Yeah, some of them are like that passport is the growing canvas yeah. is for sure. The um I don't know if the portfolio one is or not. Also I wanted to point out this upcoming changes. Um, I mentioned this again, but just you know, deprecation the great old grid books being deprecated um, January 18th. Also, um, as of, did they change this? Sorry. I don't know why this mouse is acting weird. Sorry, y'all. Um, let me go here. Here we go. As of January 18th, also, these feature options are going to be automatically turned on in your instance. So, rubric criterion, anonymous grading, student context cards, and dashboard images for cards. Those things will no longer be like feature options. Yeah. They're just going to be turned on. Okay. But you can also subscribe to this page, y'all, to get, you know, if you were logged in, I'm not going to be able to log in because I'm not logged in on this. This is where I've just got that other browser tab open. But you can log in and you can subscribe to changes and they'll send you an email. And then also just remember these release notes. Um, there are release notes by product. So like one of the things that would be um, be important is to stay abreast of the, the um, mobile releases because those are things that you know change really quickly. Um, and then the Canvas release notes, of course, we have basically one release a month. So you can see that things like yeah, like, I always catch it on Twitter somewhere. I don't, but I you don't get an email. That's not a good email. Well, I personally like I I say I just have to link this because I don't get an email or anything either. I just need to go look for it. Mm -hmm. um, but they like last month one of the cool things was with new quizzes they instituted the feature where teachers can submit in progress attempts so students don't finish. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so. And also, of course, they talked about the health mini being added. So that's how you stay abreast. Um, again, don't forget um, those term dates. We talked about all that stuff before. 
if you have something that you want to talk about during a statewide meeting, feel free to suggest that. If you have something you want to talk about during these home base meetups, feel free to suggest that. Um, if you have a teacher that you want to highlight, this isn't something I put in here, but if you have a teacher you want to highlight in the home base bulletin, um, I would really love for people to give me some more suggestions. Uh, I know Casey's actually looking for somebody from Union County for us to try to do next month. Um, and I do hope that we're able to do that. Um, but I'll show you. So all of the ones that we've done in the past are in that NC Canvas course. Um, under modules, I probably I need to update the home page that has those links that I've just been working on adding them in here. Uh, here we go. So you can see the types of things we've highlighted so far. So for Rockingham County, we had um, interdisciplinary middle school ELA and social studies teachers that are using a Canvas course to co-teach. Um, from Charlotte Meth, we had a pre-K language lab and EC C teacher, speech teacher who are using Canvas. And they're, I mean, it's pretty cool because they're using it to mm -hmm. basically the parents at home to work on develop language skill mm -hmm. development. And the parents are the ones submitting the assignments because they're like, we're working with the kids and, getting, and the parents That's are submitting right. assignments. That's really neat. Um, you've got some um, teacher collaboration here from Johnston County and how they're using it at their um, early college. Um, it's not only are teachers um, you know, co-creating courses and sharing that coursework, but also like all freshmen are enrolled in like a freshman academy course. Mm -hmm. And all of the freshman teachers, I don't know why that sounds weird to me, but anyway, all the teachers who teach freshmen <laughs> are enrolled in that course as a teacher and they co-teach the class. They, so each teacher has like input into these are skills, these are resources, these are things that freshmen need to be to know to be successful in my course. So we're going to add it into the freshman academy course. Super cool. Um, you've got here, this is from um, Pitt County. How and I had to think about it for a second, which county it's been a while. Um, how she uses um, Canvas for a flipped classroom. She also talks about how it's super important it is for her with her parent interaction and how it's been helpful there. So that was a really good. Um, resource. Let me get back. Um, we talked about um, the upcoming just things, CCS and Canvas and things, which I want to talk about in a second. Um, blended learning in Canvas. I think this was, I, think I remember correctly. Yeah, this was Union County. Um, it's UCB. So we talked about how Canvas is used um, in a blended learning environment, it's not just virtual, but um, in a blended learning environment. We talked about that. Um, state wide recording, getting started. Um, P this was, um, sorry, Canvas for PLCs and common assessments. And then Iredale State School talks about how he uses Canvas to support the coaching cycle. Oh, yeah. So if you have anything, so from, I guess basically yeah. thinking about how, if, whether it's a teacher that's using Canvas in a real innovative way in a classroom or just consistent, it doesn't even have to be innovative, just consistent and has good feedback. Or if it's an instructional coach or instructional facilitator or, or team or curriculum team or principals using it for, I'd love to hear a principal talk about how they're using Canvas either for their faculty meetings or book studies or PLCs or something. Um, if you have anybody that you think that we could call out, you see the, the length of the newsletters. I mean, they're not that long. Usually what I do is I schedule like a half hour call with a person and I just take notes while they tell me what they're doing. I type it up, send it to them for their approval, send it to you all for your approval, and then we sh I share it with Pam. Mm -hmm. We don't have to write it. No. Oh. No, I'll write it. <laughs> now, you, yeah, you just try. Yeah, you just put me in touch with the person and tell them it's okay to talk to me, and, I, and I'll, I'll do it. But I do let you approve it. Um, and, and we've had a couple times when the district has said, let me reword something. I'm fine with that. I want to make sure. Yeah, you don't have to write it. You can write it. Hey, if you want to, <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> um, oh, we also talked about content credit for Canvas webinars. I forgot about that one. That was a really good one. Uh, so she talked about how she's using those content, those webinars that we're doing and giving teachers content credit for them because she's making them do stuff with the webinar content in their content area. Yeah. Um, so that was really nice because, you know, teachers sometimes have a hard time getting those credits. Um, so I didn't mean to overlook that one. So just, yeah, anything that you're doing that you think that we might want to use. 
I'd rather tell other people's stories. <laughs> um, but those Canvas webinars, the ones that are upcoming, I'm not going to read all this to you, but again, please make sure you're advertising these. We'll add in the recording from December this week, too. And then, are there any other hot topics that have been added? No. no. Do y'all have anything, anybody online or anybody in person that you want to talk about before we say we're going to have an early afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> And that just made everybody completely silent. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, I was going to show you the, um, how elementary does their content resources to be in there. Okay. That might be something that you want to talk to somebody about. Do you have it, is it in here? Like, if I go look well, at it? I mean, it's, it's, or you can get to us. Yeah, I get to. Except I got to get to the right tab, but where I'm on. <clears throat> All right, so. Uh, this course. And then Darlene has a question. She's of course, 781178. I mean, seven, eight, one, seven, eight. Seven, eight, one, seven, eight. Just because I'm a new to the elementary world, and so this is kind of amazing to me. So this, all the elementary teachers, we have this on, it's internal only, of course, and we have it on, for, um, on the teacher start page, they can click here, then if they're looking for any content, by their grade level, you know, and subject, they can click on something. Third grade math. Yeah, so math is work in progress because it's all, oh, you're not going to see it because you're not logged in because it's all That's embedded okay. Google stuff. Yeah. So if you go back, so it's it's embedded Google stuff that just takes them to all sorts of things. So if you scroll down, that is central resources. I didn't have any clue that that was there, but it, it gives them, and this is all coaches work, it gives them, you know, uh, handouts for different things and our little genius bar there and that's um, great you know uh like grade book stuff is there um if they need help with their grade book and all with that like in a canvas course so union county has recently i mean if i can speak to it has recently made it at the canvas k-12 um and so one of the things that they do is they ask for because so uh, i'm not a canvas event but that's why you don't see it but they told teachers they have to link their canvas course syllabus that has to be public to um, their school websites um, and so she's given directions for them to do that and that's kind of like a first step right we're going to say everybody's got to use canvas so everybody's going to use it for your course syllabus. and it's, it's a really work in progress for elementary but at least their direction is mm -hmm. there <clears throat> and um, that's really neat <laughs> so it's a what kind of a one-stop shopping it's like a symbol it's almost things. like a symbol loop yeah 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 but it's all google embedded stuff so then my coaches don't have to be canvas experts they can just be putting all their resources in google mm -hmm. i just needed somebody to manage this side of it but they you know like they're not over here messing up stuff <laughs> cool um it, it's 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 a really nice resource i didn't have no idea i didn't have any idea they had it until i got moved to elementary this year Really, so we're the amazing guys at all that stuff. So, so it's a housing. Yes, yeah, all some of yours is kind of similar. Yeah. The more that, that you're able to have show them how to use it personally, and like then they start with the navigation and start feeling more comfortable. The less scary it gets to try and jump in as a teacher. And then, and because of the mandate, we purchased two um, templates from you. Yeah. And um, I've been working with my elementary folks on on that. Um, and that's been great. I didn't realize there was so much customization already built into that. Um, that's pretty cool. Do you want me to show an elementary template? Is that it? Maybe. Yeah, that's it. But what's so cool about this, if you want to scratch on that, but then if you go um, to the top and click on modules um all those things are evidently somebody's playing with this one if you go down to the template icons banners and buttons up a little bit right there right there oh About sorry sorry, yeah. sorry i was like so all those buttons on the front like here's a bunch of other things that's with that same theme that i could use and i'm down here um I could open these up and they open Google Draw and I can edit them and let it say what I want to say with it. So that's what I love about this template is that it's it has, be right here. Yeah, it just has you go to Google Draw and then you could 
You could customize it. You could add your name as a teacher. That's what my some of my teachers are. If you scroll them down, the, the little buttons are here. So like I could take those off and put their names off, you know, and keep the same theme and everything rounded. Because that's the hard part is keeping the same theme if you wanted to add more things to it. So um, we, we felt like this was a very good investment to get our elementary folks. Um, I didn't look at the high school one, to be honest. And that's probably not it. That's old. That person is gone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know where my high school one is because I didn't realize. Yeah, that person's gone. Um, yes, yeah, so that's old. Those are old. Yeah, those are old. Um, I don't think that's old. I don't know what the high school one looks like. It's in Commons. I know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're in Commons, but and the work with those folks. Yeah. Yeah, so that that was huge as far as um, getting people. Um, if you, yeah, okay. I go up and just say, put the thing at the top, only when you can improve. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and this is just going to show you that um, mm -hmm. I would have to import it to yeah. see it all, mm -hmm. but this shows you that. It's kind of got the same. But it probably looks different. There's a yeah. whole page though. So it looks a little bit different, yeah. yeah. It looks more grown up. You know, I, I have a love hate relationship with like the whole home page, customized home page thing, because I worry that when teachers see that, did y'all see that little embedded embed code that was like in the middle of that mm -hmm. template page mm -hmm. for a second? I get scared that when teachers see that that I've got to do something to customize it, they get um they get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Oh, Once yeah. a teacher has a basic yeah. understanding how to add content to Canvas, then I absolutely <laughs> think absolutely this changes the game for them because this makes them makes it pretty. Mm -hmm. It makes it more engaging. It makes. I it met with the first the grade team last week about this, and I mean immediately these two were like boom. They hit edit. They were going. They were doing all that stuff. And these two over here were like, you know, like right. Can I touch this or not? But these two, they had already made buttons, but their names aren't that this and this is. And I was like. Okay, you know, I didn't show me anything. I just showed them like how to get there and I did edit and they were going to town. So, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, Glad to hear that. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, the question for selections for dashboard we done for the dashboard to star. Um, it was in the release notes, Starlene. And so, basically, from the home page now, um, from my, or excuse me, from my dashboard. I can eat, I can unfavorite stuff. So, and this was in the last release, I think it was November 16th. So let's say like, I don't want this course on my homepage. I can just move and I can unfavorite. And now it goes away. So for any ones that I want to take off of my dashboard, I can just unfavorite them right there. That's so cool. I think that was the last question, y'all. Yeah. I will see you in February. Have a wonderful Woo. afternoon. Oh, okay. The session's at the meetup. Maybe not at the meetup, but at the CCES. They could they be different. Like, yeah, there, there's like three different options. Oh. So when you go and submit, there's like, I think there's a 45 minute, a 90 minute, and then I think a two and a half hour. Did you get that email that came out? Today. I saw one come through. I had yeah. checked that. It's well. got the answer to all right. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be James Parker. <laughs> so please, Jay. <laughs> so please we'll make sure you guys think about what sessions to submit for CPS. Well, yeah, we have the email Kathy sent out about asking the, the committee to, to do some for LTES stuff. Um, I mean, but. And she said she was going to do something. And see, this year is supposed to be like the planning year. And I know the budget has stopped all of the planning right. and everything. So, I mean, we just kind of don't know, like, what to do. Because right. we were supposed to be planning how we're going to roll out the student, the institute right. and stuff. And we hadn't been able, because we hadn't met since they approved it. Right. Well, you don't have any money to. I know, so that's what I was like. I know. Nobody has money. So. Well, y'all, if anybody wants to host a um, Saturday teacher half day event, we also will be looking in March, April to have yeah. one. We did one here last year, so if y'all want to host, again, you're welcome to. Well, we, we want one in February. We've already. February? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we were just talking about. Um, oh. Let me see what you're talking about.
Not today. Um, but we yeah, should but we're not going to do it January, but we moved it to, we, we're going to do it because she's calling them pop up days. Yeah, I remember she called me about that. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to try to plan those again. Y'all remember the campus campus things last year where we did, and so we gave teachers yeah. credit. recommended DLC credits. <laughs> I've gotten good at like making sure I say recommended and stuff. <laughs> Please follow your local process, include some artifacts. <laughs> <laughs> I have it on repeat. You do. You do. Every webinar. Yeah. And I've only got 55 webinars this year. Yeah. Just 55. And you, so you're, you just really just made it your sleep. But yeah, it's we like do. the EOG. Please place your number two pencil down. If you do not have a number two pencil, raise your hand. Provide it for you. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, Kevin. Y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you, you so too. much. All right. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.